Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. This is my recap for the 2023 anime called Undead Unlock. If you like my recaps, please consider subscribing. The story begins as we watch two different scenes. One scene is of a post-apocalyptic world where a couple goes their separate ways. The other scene is of a little girl waving goodbye as a plane is about to take off. In the romantic scene, the couple must find their way back to each other, but must quickly embrace as they prepare for impending doom. In the other scene, the little girl sees that it begins to snow, but is then mortified when the plane she was waving at catches fire and explodes right before her eyes. We are then introduced to Izumo, as she just finished reading a romantic comic, and she wishes that her youth would have been more like the story she just read. She sighs in relief as she has finally finished the manga, which means she can now end herself. Just then, a guy with muscles that could double as speed bumps calls out to her and points out how obviously dangerous it is for her to stand there. She explains to him that all she ever wanted was a shot at passionate romance like the one in her manga. But thanks to something wrong with her body, that'll never happen. This is why she has chosen to die. This super dramatic girl threatens the man to not mess with her, but he doesn't seem to take her seriously at all. She continues her threat by revealing that anyone that touches her will contract an incurable disease and die. The bulging behemoth of muscles just calmly listens, and she reiterates that she has nothing good to live for with a body like hers. The emotional pain she feels causes her to close her eyes, but the walking mountain of muscles strangely just walks right into the knife she was threatening him with. She has no clue what's going on as she wonders if she stabbed him, and the man grabs her head. It turns out that he has never heard of a deadly disease transmitted by touch, but he thinks it's cool. The cycle points out that thus have been getting pretty stale, and he excitedly waits to feel the poison. He says that he touched her and is excited as he wonders if the poison's going to hurt. She tells him that her unluck is coming, and the guy is shocked as the cement beneath his feet breaks and his body gets introduced to a speeding train. Izumo is completely beside herself as she apologizes to the stranger for doing it again. She condemns herself for dragging another person into her problem and blames herself for taking too long to end it all. However, she is shocked to hear the guy's voice again and even more startled when his head rolls over to her. This guy is way too excited for someone that was just decapitated and he realizes that this disease stuff she said was just a front to protect others. Izumo then watches in utter disbelief as the guy propels his head forward with his blood and reconstructs his own body. The human blood rocket determines that it's his lucky day since he found someone like her, but she isn't listening to a word he is saying. She is still completely shocked and frantically calls him a zombie as she gives him a painful punch and runs away. This guy is quick on his feet as he manages to propel his entire body to capture her and explains that he is undead. He has some questions about the unluck thing she mentioned, but the cops are on their way. He tells her to hold on and takes off like a blood-fueled jet. He wonders if she was impressed with his leaping abilities and explains that he simply regenerated his torn off legs at high speeds and used the momentum to do it. Izumo completely ignores the regenerating psychopath and tries to get away. He just captures her again, but Izumo is quick to remind him that he's touching her and he will trigger her unluck again. The guy won't be fooled though and correctly points out that he should be okay as long as he only touches her clothes. She just wants him to let her go, but he points out that it's a long way down, and all he wants is more information about her unluck. Izumo freaks out for a bit, but soon realizes that she was planning on dying that same day anyway. She claims that his threats won't scare her, so he has the brilliant idea to just spin her around at absurd speeds. Izumo can hardly stand the psychopath's torture, and she frantically agrees to tell him everything. Afterwards, her explanation starts 10 years ago, when she was only 8 years old. Her parents were heading overseas on business and she was seeing them off. They said they'd be gone for a week so they hugged her a whole bunch before they left. About half an hour later, their plane encountered unexpected engine trouble. All 270 people aboard, including her parents, died. It was then that she learned, although the degree of it varies, that people who touch her end up getting hurt. That's how she figured out that she caused what happened to her mom and dad. This is why she covers her bare skin from head to toe. She has a hard time speaking as this is a very personal thing she's telling this complete stranger, but he rudely interjects and hugs her. She wonders if he even listened to what she said, but he very much has. What he understood was that touching her brings out a stroke of unluck, and he has now decided to test it. She tells him that he needs to run while he still can, but it's too late and a fallen crate turns him into a banana pancake. Izumo takes this moment to get away from the flattened psychopath, but he quickly regenerates, unsatisfied with the results. Unfortunately for her, she slips on a banana peel and falls right off the building as the guy enjoys a snack. 
Izumo, in disbelief to be dying to a straight banana peel, the funniest sad way to die, points out that she never even had the chance to experience anything. As she falls, her precious manga leaves her pocket, and she begs and pleads that it not end this way. The ground is quickly approaching, so she breaks down as she finally realizes that she isn't ready. Just then, our hero appears to grab her and her book. He uses his strange ability to slow them down and tells Izuma that there's no way that he's letting her die. This is because he believes that he has finally found the power that will give him a real death. He reveals that he knows there's a rule she tried to hide from him earlier. He thinks that if he can figure out what that rule is, then he can make an even bigger stroke of unluck happen. His goal is to bring out the greatest stroke of unluck she has in her, in the hopes that he can finally end his ridiculously long life. He uses his admittedly gross power to fly again and declares that it's time to head back to his hideout and figure out her unluck ability. However, in the distance, we see that he is being watched. The suit explains to someone that the human blood dispenser is en route to his hideout with what they call the new breed, and he is instructed to apprehend her after confirming her ability. At his hideout, the undead guy just discovered that how long he touches her correlates with the size of her unluck. The next test he wants to do is surface area, so he instructs her to take off her clothes so he can cling to as wide an area as possible. That doesn't happen though as she takes off running. She demands that he give up on his experiments, but he tells her that it's her fault for not just telling him how her unluck works. Unfortunately for her, she gets caught on a nail and loses her hat. Undead makes a quip about Rapunzel's hair, but she breaks down in tears. She can't believe that someone has seen her absurdly long hair, and explains that no one's able to cut it for her since any hairstylist would just end up dead. Undead, ever the problem solver, breaks out some scissors and starts cutting away. He points out that as long as he is touching her, no unlock will come his way, so he will just finish up giving her a fresh cut in the meantime. This is true, but she reminds him that once he lets go, all the built-up unluck will hit him all at once. She fears how bad it will be, but he stops her and confidently explains that he is undead. Luckily for her, he was a stylist a long time ago, and he finishes up quickly. She is too hesitant to look, but once she does, she is glad. Izumo sees that he has let her go and thanks him. Undead, more excited than ever, points out that he held on to her for 15 minutes straight and expects that the next unlock should be a doozy. She has no clue what will happen, but we see that his head gets removed. It's the suit from earlier and he thanks Izumo for getting Undead to let his guard down. Before he explains who they are, he states that they will have to contain Undead in a special capsule first. She wonders why they did that and is shocked to be handcuffed. She thought they were on her side, but they laugh at her for being so naive. They explain that their job is to police any unselected negators, such as herself, or any UMAs that throw the world into chaos. Just like myself, she has no clue what they are talking about, and the guy goes on to explain that her ability is extremely unique. They have determined that her ability negates the luck of whoever touches her, and kills them. An ability perfectly suited for murder. However, touching her through cloth keeps one perfectly safe. He states that her ability's weakness is that once its conditions are known, it's easy to counter it with gloves. She realizes that they want to do something with her power, and they point out that obviously they want to use it for killing. He is sure that Undead wanted to use it for the same, since she would be quite the ferocious weapon if she bent to his will. Izumo finally speaks up and tells them that they are wrong. Even if they just met, Undead only used her unluck on himself so that only he could die. She proclaims that that new zombie friend of hers isn't anything like him, but the suit doesn't want to hear it. He warns her to watch her mouth since he doesn't mind disposing of her instead of capturing her. Izumo breaks down in tears because unlike everyone else, Undead touched her without an ounce of fear. She blames herself since this happened to him because he cut her hair, but she is grateful he did. She thanks Undead and just then, the suit holding Undead is struck by lightning. The other suits wonder if it was her unluck but determined that it wasn't because the requirements were not met. They assume it was a stroke of his own unluck, but she tells them that they are wrong, and that was no fluke. Just then, Izumo is elated to see that Undead has returned, and the human blood rocket is furious. The suit states that guns are ineffective against Undead, and they have to attack him all at once to cut him down. Furthermore, he may be Undead, but he's an amateur when it comes to combat. Undead is insulted to hear this. He explains that he might seem like an amateur fighter now, but the past is a completely different story. Usually, he doesn't have enough space for so much information, so he puts a lid on his brain to keep a hundred years worth of memories bottled up. Otherwise, he would lose his mind. With the thing removed from his brain, Undead regains all his knowledge of fighting and easily defeats the enemies. Undead just now realizes what happened. 
getting his noggin sliced off wasn't her unluck's doing. The unluck for the haircut was actually that lightning bolt. That was completely unexpected, and Undead determines that he needs to test for time lag in her ability. The suit realizes now that Undead isn't so simple, since the skills he cultivated through his very long life are also his weapons. The suit determines that he will have to implement a rather underhanded strategy, and threatens to kill Izumo if Undead doesn't hand over his own head without regenerating. Izumo thinks that's pointless, but the suit explains to her that Undead seems to value her quite a bit. Undead is super disappointed that the guy won't fight him since he thought it would be fun, and he shocks Izumo when he starts taking his head off. Izumo begins a dramatic speech about how she can't see any more people around her getting hurt, but Undead isn't listening and already chopped his head off. Undead states that he doesn't care a single bit about her emotions. He had fun all day and wants them to party up again if they somehow see each other again in the future. Undead hands over his head which causes his body to be destroyed. As his head flies in the air, Izuma begins to think about how the truth is she does know how to trigger the biggest stroke of unluck. She frees herself from the suit but thinks about how her plan might not go so well. She leaps into the air to give Undead's head a kiss on the cheek, leaving the suit to wonder what she did. She tells him that it was nothing special. She just thought it would be nice to cast all worries aside and touch someone. She knows that her unluck is coming and the suit has no clue what she is saying, but Undead seems to figure it out. He tells Izumo to get out of there as he regenerates, and tells the suit that he is done for. He explains that the moment the suit ran into the two of them, his luck ran out. Outside, the sky begins to light up, and Undead holds the suit as he looks up at the marvelous sight. It's a meteorite, and it completely destroys the entire building. Afterwards, Izumo worries about the zombie, but he would soon emerge from the smoke. His lighthearted attitude never changes as he happily states that he has never taken a meteorite to the face before. She's glad to see that he is alive and he compliments her on her good luck. The two finally introduce themselves but Undead doesn't have an actual name. Izuma decides to give him one and chooses Andy because he's and dead. He couldn't care less and is just amazed to see that a kiss caused all that destruction. Sometime later, Uzumo, whose first name is Fuko, thinks about how her unluck always gets people killed. Because of this, she always felt that she didn't deserve to live. However, that's when she met Undead who found her amusing. At first she hated it, but being with him helped her feel like she could keep living a bit longer. That feeling didn't last long, however, as she learned how crude Andy is. His obsession for drawing out the biggest stroke of unluck has caused him to come up with an idea. He points out how a simple kiss did massive destruction, and determines that being more intimate should bring a massive stroke of unluck with unlimited destructive possibilities. Andy doesn't want to waste any time, but Fuko is furious. She feels like he only thinks of her as a tool for dying and tries to figure out a way to get out of the situation. Fuko comes up with a solution and that is like ability. Andy has no clue what she is talking about so she explains that aside from her mom, dad and him, she has also kissed her granddad who as a side note had fake teeth so scary they could give a nightmare its own dreams. The only thing that happened to him from her kiss were sprained ankles. He passed away 3 years later but there was too much of a time lag for it to be her unluck's fault. Fuko determines that this must mean the more she likes a person, the bigger the unlucky event becomes. That means if he keeps trying to be intimate with her right now, then she will end up hating him forever, which will then lead to a crummy unluck and he will lose his shot at a proper end to his life. Our boy Andy instantly realizes what the mission is. He tells her that all he has to do now is make sure she doesn't die till it happens. She wonders what he means by it, but he's already on the move. Moments later, Fuko is shocked to be in an impressive armory with enough weapons to make John Wick blush, and Andy explains that he set up places like this all over the globe so he can battle it out with certain guys whenever he needs to. She has no clue who those guys are, but there's no time for questions. The gun-loving maniac protects his precious bringer of death by dressing her up like she's preparing for the apocalypse. She is now bulletproof, stab-proof, and even resistant to chemical weapons. He explains that it's a countermeasure against the guys that attack them. They are an organization that polices unidentified mysteries like themselves. To them, they are the ones that they have to keep in check, and it's almost guaranteed that a second group of them will be showing up soon. Fuko thinks they might have scared them by bringing down a meteorite from space and all, but Andy states that there's no chance that they are scared. The organization has massive firepower of their own, people just like them. Guys and girls who negate the rules of this world, aptly called negators. This organization got a front row seat to their unluck and undead abilities, but the abilities of the organization members are unknown. 
They don't stand a chance, so Andy has decided that they need to run. He reveals that 50 years ago, those negators caught him and messed him up pretty bad. He spent the next 10 years in a lab getting his body tested on constantly. This makes Andy really curious about what they would do to Fuko if they caught her. There's no telling how many people would have their lives ended just to confirm the rules of her unluck. Andy shows a bit of how his crazy dark imaginative mind works as he points out that they might even cut off parts of her body to see if her unluck still works when detached. Fuko can't stand hearing that and instantly agrees that they need to run. They ride off on their adorable tandem motorcycle and Andy shows that he can get hyped no matter what the situation. Unfortunately, our carefree hero has no destination in mind and his plan is to just keep running. Fuko feels like without a plan, it's only a matter of time before they are caught and she is already enough of a liability to him. She fears what will happen to him if they get caught like the day before, but he calms her down. He explains that till she falls madly in love with him and gives him the biggest stroke of unluck possible, he promises he won't let her die. Fuko is shocked that he hasn't given up on her falling for him, but our confident protagonist guarantees it will happen. Just then, the sky tears apart like a phone screen in a world without cases, and Andy explains that that is how they warp. The guys that captured him 50 years ago popped out of one of those skyhole things too. Something huge emerges from it and Andy, recognizing it immediately, calls them the Union. The giant robot of destruction does some serious damage and Fugo tries to rush towards Andy. However, she is pulled by a guy that can clearly tell she likes undead by the way she was running. She determines that he must be an enemy and is shocked when she realizes that her legs won't move. The robot tells the guy to end the girl's life since her orders are to capture undead and dispose of unluck. The guy wants to chat with her for a bit though, but this only gives Andy time for a surprise attack. He goes in for a powerful strike, but Fuko is shocked when his body just stops moving. The guy with the neck as thick as a tree trunk promises that he isn't to blame, and Andy realizes that his body won't budge at all. Specifically, his arm, legs, and torso. Robocop lands a powerful punch, but this makes Andy realize something as he can now move his body again. Fuko tries to tell him that Nexilla behind her is the movement stopper since he is stopping her from moving, but Andy points out that she is moving her hands right now. It's only her legs that aren't moving, so the two are definitely not related. He explains that both of these guys are external targeting restraining type negators. They seem similar, but the ranges and abilities aren't. Robocop in a suit paralyzes his body, and he assumes that the blue haired dude has her will. The problem is, he doesn't know what exactly they're negating to pull this off. The guy with the neck so thick he could wear a hula hoop as a choker is impressed that Andy figured out that much. However, he points out that simply knowing that doesn't mean a thing. Andy doesn't seem to care whenever that guy talks and takes a punch to test his theory. He finds that he is right since he can move just fine after getting hit and determines that all he has to do now is get hit, fix himself up, and punch the robot back. The overgrown toaster calls him an idiot and the two go back and forth exchanging punches. The blue haired guy is impressed by Andy, considering he's enduring an immense amount of pain, but can't help but point out how outrageous his fighting style is. Fuku is frustrated when she wonders if they're going to get chased by people like them forever, and he tells her that it's only if they manage to keep getting away. He points out that the meteorite they used didn't help their case, since it made their capture priority levels rise to 8 on a scale of 10, and she was only a 5 when she was first discovered. Now, no matter how many hunters they avoid, there will always be other menacing people gunning for them. She is shocked to hear that he means other negators like themselves and wonders why they aren't being hunted like them. Just then, the robot uses boosters to power up his punch and knocks Andy's head off. The guy with the neck so thick all his scarves file for early retirement is glad to hear that they have piqued Fuko's interest. We finally learn that his name is Shen and the robot wants him to stop answering her questions. Shen thinks she has the right to know and tells her that there are 10 members. They belong to the Anti-Unidentified Phenomena Control Organization, aka Union. Within its ranks, there's a special team made up of 10 negators. Once in, negators are exempt from pursuit on the condition that they commit to carrying out missions. There are a few tests that need to be passed first though. Fuko is excited to realize that they could be safe if they become members, but the robot threatens her and explains that all the seats are taken. As long as there are no vacancies, the roster sees no additions or changes. Any negator who isn't a member is a UMA who throws the world into chaos, a monster. The robot prepares to end Fuko, but Andy instantly saves her. He listened to everything. He has decided that instead of getting hunted, they will just join the hunting party. 
He is super hyped about it and explains that they will just destroy these two guys to make space for them on the team. It's uncertain what they will make them do when on the team, but Andy once again promises that he will never let her die. Not only that, but handing her over to anyone is also not an option. With that said, Fuku knows exactly what to do and touches Andy's chest. The hunk of metal, just like the best man at a wedding, points out how they just made direct contact. But Shen says it was only a small area, so the unluck isn't going to be that bad. Fuko, who has distanced herself, tells Andy that she is certain that a huge unluck is coming. Not wanting any misunderstandings, she explains that the massive size of the unluck doesn't mean she is in love with him. She only likes him out of gratitude. The robot tries to tell Shen to go after the girl, but he doesn't respond well to being bossed around. Fuko continues to try and set things straight while Andy prepares for the unluck. She confirms one last time that she's not falling in love with Andy, just as Truck Kun makes an emphatic appearance. Andy tells the two guys that it's time to give up their seats on the team, and Truck Kun blows up all over them. They just barely manage to escape, and Andy leads them on a chase. He explains that negators either negate their own rules or those of others. When fighting against external targeting negators like them, you have to figure out what they are negating as soon as possible. Andy shows that he's actually quite smart as he is determined that when the Jumbotron gets an attack stance, he negates his movements, which should mean its power is called unavoidable. Shen is still a mystery though since he was able to restrain Fuko without any kind of specific movement. He decides to stay hidden and use some hit and run tactics till he figures them out. Andy prepares for an attack we haven't seen yet, but is shocked to find that the building is filled with dynamite. Fuko rushes over wondering if she's at fault for the explosion and we see that the evil duo are still alive. The robot has had enough of the girl, since unless they can predict what will happen, her unluck is not a weapon, it's a disaster. However, he decides that he will destroy the defenseless Andy first. He tells Shen that their mission is almost complete, but is shocked when he realizes that Undead is actually the one behind him. Andy tells him that he can have his hand, since body parts that he loses disappear in 30 seconds anyway. Andy prepares his next attack by biting down on his own finger. He bids farewell to Unavoidable and sends his fingertip straight through its robot brain. Andy calls this his parts bullet. He uses his regenerative power to shoot his half-torn body parts like projectiles. He shows that he completely figured out the robot by pointing out that each time he got an attack stance, he negated his opponent's ability to avoid. Strictly speaking, he only stopped muscle movements while it was in effect. Unfortunately for the tin can, he couldn't stop Andy's regeneration. Shen arrives shocked to see that the robot has been destroyed. Andy tells him that he is next, but Shen tries to point out that he just secured his seat on the team. Andy, ever the gentleman, says that he just secured Fuko's seat on the team, but he needs one too. Shen prepares for battle and Andy wonders what he negates. He determines that he will just have to find out the same way he always does, and that's by getting his life ended over and over again. Andy initiates the fight by targeting the opening in Shen's stance, with his right leg but is stunned to see that he attacked with his left leg instead. Fuko arrives just in time to see that the two are battling it out. Shen can barely hold back his joy as he points out how amazing Andy is since he never thought anyone would be able to lay a hand on him. Shen would give anything to spar against him on a regular basis and Fuko can't believe that they seem to have become friends. Andy thinks he is clearly just messing with him and tells Fuko to toss him his sword. Fuko fears that Andy won't catch the sword but he tells her to throw it anyway. Andy continues fighting and states that he may not know exactly what Shen negates, but his power is all about opposites. Shen purposely teases a gap in his defenses and prepares a defense on the opposite side. Right goes left, up goes down. It's incredibly annoying, but Andy determines that's all there is to it. Andy catches his sword with his neck just after figuring out his opponent and goes in to end the fight. Unfortunately, he is somehow stopped. Shen explains that it was only for a split second, but Andy hesitated on whether or not to cut him down. Shen is surprised since despite being alive for nearly 200 years, Andy still hesitates when it comes to ending people. Either that or perhaps he didn't want Little Miss Unlucky to see him take someone's life. Shen is now the one that's ready to end the fight, but Fuko heroically jumps in to unluck this fool. He avoids her easily though. Shen won't reveal his rule to them, but does tell them that they won't be able to run away or touch him. His power works on their deep psyche, so it's no use trying to resist. Andy scolds Fuko for jumping in, but she points out that she was just trying to help. Shen asks which one of them will be joining the team, and Andy doesn't even hesitate as it's clearly Fuko. Andy is prepared to be taken away to a lab to be tested on, but Fuko reminds him how poorly they treated him 
and wonders why he would volunteer to go again. He explains that she wouldn't last a day there, but she is worried he might never be able to escape again. He tells her not to worry though, since he guarantees to slip out before she dies, even if it ends him. Even if she becomes a hunchbacked old bag, he promises to win her heart. Andy tells the two of them to leave already, but Fugo tells them to wait. She tells Shen to look away, but he explains that he can't since it will undo his ability. She tells him that he has to and shocks everyone when she reveals that she's going to get intimate with Andy. Andy reminds her that she has to fall head over heels for him first, but she tells him to shut up. Because of how messed up her body is, she has never experienced even a tiny bit of romance. She has no clue if she has fallen for him or not, but he is someone that is willing to fight for her pitiful sake until he's a bloody mess. This is why she can't just abandon him without giving up something that just might give him the unlucky needs to end himself. She dramatically apologizes for not being able to do more to repay him, but this just makes Shen break out in uncontrollable laughter. Their relationship is hilarious to him, especially since they just met one day ago. They are such a comedic duo that Shen thinks splitting the two of them up would be a capital offense. Instead, Shen shockingly states that he will have the two of them kill another one of the members on his team. If they do, he will put in a good word for both of them. He explains that in three days, at Lake Baikal, one member will make a move to investigate a UMA. If they end this member that shows up there, then they are golden. This person will be wearing a red necktie and an emblem. Before he leaves, he warns them that there will still be people hunting them along the way. He hopes that they both make it in one piece so they can meet again at the round table and leaves. Foucault is shocked that he spared them and Andy points out that it was because of her deviant behavior. She tells him that she was serious about what she said, but Andy is a man of impeccable honor and tells her that he doesn't want to do things that way. It was completely reckless. He orders her to never pull a stunt like that again and she agrees. Their next stop is Russia, but Fuku points out that she doesn't have a passport. That's okay since our crazy hero doesn't trust public transportation. The plan is to drive top speed to Nagata. Next they will hop on his yacht and book it to a Russian port. Then they will swap to a jet plane and head to Irkutsky where he will hire some of his old war buddies to give them some combat support. Then they lie in wait for their target at the lake and end them. And he's more hyped than ever to be going to Russia where there's plenty of vodka. He's glad to hear that Fuku is 18 years old, which is a legal drinking age there, and our crude protagonist promises that they will have a drink when they are done. A brief look into the past takes us to 1970, where we find Andy in a Union isolation facility. A young girl with pink hair is in a separate room where an hourglass sits in the center. The two can see each other through glass and Andy uses his blood to wish the young girl a happy birthday. Back to the present, we see that a girl with pink hair is in outer space and looks down on a boat. She seems pleased as we get some obvious hints that she was the young girl from the past. Back on Earth, Andy is pretty pleased with his souped up ship and explains to Fuko that they will reach Russia in no time. He can't understand why Fuko was so terrified though, so she reminds him that Chen said they would be hunted aggressively the entire way there. Our hero calmly tries to persuade her to come out of hiding, but she gets proven right when alarms start going off and missiles rain down from the sky. As the fighter jet showers them with attacks, Andy just wishes that he would have had time to have a drink. Fuku can't believe how calm he is right now, but he points out how lousy of a shot their attacker is. Besides that, even if his little boat gets blown to pieces, he points out that they can just use her unluck to blow their way out of the situation. Fuku tries to explain that her unluck doesn't just conveniently work that way, but our brilliant protagonist explains that it's all about how she uses it. Andy isn't just full of nonsense as he proves his point by stating that his undead ability isn't just about death prevention. He demonstrates by cutting his own arm that if he cuts a part of his body nearly off and makes it grow back in place, it becomes a weapon. His part's bullet fist destroys their attacker and Fuku foolishly wonders if that means they are now part of Union. Andy reminds her that Chen told him that in order to get into Union, they have to kill the person with the emblem on them. Andy points out that the two goons from the other day had gold marks on them and assumes that it's the emblem the ten members wear. Off the top of his currently attached head, Andy has three people in mind who probably wear the emblem. First is the maker of the indestructible katana that he stole. They call this guy Unbreakable. Second is the engineer-like guy who experimented on him 50 years ago. And third is the person who nabbed him 50 years ago. A lady who can create invisible barriers. Andy explains that this pink-haired chick once packed his head into her invisible barrier, and those things were extremely sturdy. He points out that he is undead, but that does not mean he is unbeatable. He warns that things will be really bad for them if they somehow match up against this girl. 
Fuko can't believe that there is someone that our hero can't beat and hopes they never face Barrier Girl. Our always positive blood dispensing protagonist states that he couldn't care any less about all that. No matter who gets in their way, they will do whatever it takes to get to the lake and kill their target. He proclaims that nothing's going to keep them from their goal, and if worse comes to worse, then they can just rely on her unluck. Fuko once again tells him that they can't rely on her unluck like that, but this just seems to excite our zombie of a hero. Andy heads back to the captain's seat as another fighter jet has appeared, and tells Fuko that he will have to get a real good feel for her unluck's rules before things start getting more dangerous. She fears this means that he plans to get all pervy with her, but our blunt protagonist doesn't deny it one single bit. Fuko reminds him that if he does anything like that, then his likability won't get any better, but the confident Andy is sure that everything will be fine. A look into space shows that the one attacking is the girl from earlier, and she exclaims that undead never changes. She gets this crazy look in her face and states that he is the only man in this world that she was able to love. The crazy space girl launches a powerful attack from her space station, but knows that he will be alright because he never changes, and she is certain that he will make his way back to her. Back on Earth, Andy's ship is destroyed and he can't figure out what attacked them. He finds a trail of bubbles that lead him right to Fuko, who was unconscious. This dude must have went to medical school or something because he states that if she is asphyxiating or in cardiac arrest, each minute docks her survival rate by 10%. Unfortunately, her legs are caught under the wreckage. Andy cuts his hands off and wedges his arm stumps in between. He grows them back rapidly so that the force frees them and the human blood torpedo takes them to the surface. Fuko wakes up soon after, which Andy is glad to see, but he warns that they are about to get caught and instructs her to put her hands up. Fuko wonders if he really plans to just surrender, but he explains that he is just buying some time for a little experiment of his. It will likely help them figure out whether her unluck can be controlled or not. She reminds him that it can't be controlled since it's the source of all her issues, but he points out that she just can't control it at will. I guess Andy's some kind of scientist too, as he has a hypothesis. He points out that her previous strokes of unluck were phenomena that utilized things around her. But the lightning bolt from the haircut and the meteorite from the peck on the cheek were different. They were things from far away that her unluck forcibly pulled. He thinks that it happened because the haircut and the kiss are things that she has great personal value for. In those moments though, materials needed for strokes of unluck equal to the things she values a lot were not nearby. So those materials with equal value had to be pulled from far away. This entire conversation is really embarrassing for Fuko, but it only gets worse from here. Andy explains that for his experiment, he found a source that she surely has great personal value for that'll produce a stroke of unluck equal to that value. And the unluck that is going to come from it will be huge. Fuko has no clue what he did, but realizes that her top has been messed with, and Andy explains that in order to save her fleeting life, he had to perform CPR. She can't believe it and hopes that is all he did. Unfortunately for her, Andy explains that she still wasn't waking up. As he talks, Fuka gets more and more embarrassed and the ocean begins to swell beneath them. Andy makes the grand reveal of his experiment as he explains that he had to resort to mouth to mouth resuscitation and Fuko's unluck causes the oil tank in the ocean to explode. Once on the jet, Andy uses his special move called Crimson Crescent Moon to instantly eliminate the pilot. Andy explains that the attack is a quick draw slash that's boosted by his arm's repair powers. Fuko is concerned about the lunatic's arm with the sword firmly inside of it, but he just explains that he uses it as a sheath sometimes. The jet begins to take a nosedive, but our hero takes control of it. Sometime later, our blood gushing scientist points out that his experiment was a success. All they have to do is find a seed of unluck like the oil tank they just used and get a grasp of the contact level suitable for triggering it. This way, her unluck won't just be accidents, but the best trump card to turn things around in a fight. There might be a glimmer of hope in Fuko's eyes, but she still can't accept it. She thinks that it was just a fluke and tells him that relying on her is a bad idea. Andy's positivity is unwavering though. He gets hyped to go get some vodka and she can't believe that he's already changing the point of the trip. A while later, the jet's self-destruct sequence begins and Andy has to eject them. It's obvious that they figured out it was stolen, but Andy is still having a good time. Fuko thinks she has to point out to him that they are currently falling from the sky. But Andy just isn't worried as he has another technique up his sleeve from his mercenary days. He calls it a 5 point landing. Andy breaks their fall first with the balls of his feet, next the side of his calves, then his butt and back. Fuko is disgusted by all the sounds of his breaking bones but it was an absolute success in Andy's eyes. Andy warns her to watch her head as their mark might be around there somewhere but they forget all that when Fuko sees the beautiful lake. 
and he explains that Lake Baikal is the world's deepest, clearest, and oldest freshwater lake. People from the organization are going to be there investigating a UMA, which makes sense as it's a pretty good spot for unidentifieds to hide out. Fuku is amazed by the sight and admits to always being a bit of a shut-in, probably because she kills everything she touches. She has never been overseas before, so Andy tells her that she should do some sightseeing. They don't have to worry about the Union either since they won't make a move with all the tourists around. Operating in secret is more their style. Andy heads off to track down his old war buddies since they'll be sure to give them the backup they need, but Fuku stops him for a moment. Her concern is about them joining the Ten and wonders who they will have to take down this time. The robot they defeated the first time clearly deserved it, but she wonders what they will do if their mark is a nice person this time. Andy doesn't hesitate for a second and says that their target is dead meat either way. He will take them down without a second thought so he can take their place in the Ten. The plan stays the same. The mood is a bit too glum for his liking so he asks Fuko if there are any foods she hates. She doesn't like wasabi so Andy explains that the buddy he's about to bring over runs a great restaurant and she will have to try the food. He leaves her for the time being but reminds her that she came all the way to Russia just now. He tells her not to waste it by being her usual timid self and urges her to have a good time. Some random Russian guys try to talk to her but she instantly runs off. She thinks about how inconsiderate Andy was to say those words since she can't have fun around people with her body the way it is. However, she realizes that if she hadn't crossed paths with him, she'd be dead by now. Just then, she notices a girl and gets caught staring at her painting. This girl is amazed by Fuko's Japanese-ness and shows off her schoolgirl uniform inspired by Japanese schoolgirls. Fuko doesn't know what to say as she never went to high school and the enthusiastic chick is just disappointed to hear that. Fuku admires this overly excited girl's painting and can instantly tell it's made from watercolors. Fuku explains that she doesn't get out often, if at all, so she dabbled in art here and there. Fuku tries to explain that she isn't very good, but this chick seems to really want a friend and asks Fuku to paint too. Fuku tries to decline as she is waiting for someone and the girl instantly speculates that it must be Fuku's boyfriend. Fuku thinks about Andy and the girl finally manages to convince her to paint. Sometime later, this girl calls Fuko Lil Lucky and points out that she has Lucky written on her cap. She asks Fuko if she likes stuff that changes or stuff that always stays the same. Before she can answer, the girl explains that she likes stuff that doesn't change. Stuff that is not tied down or swayed by anyone. This is also why she loves art so much, because you can capture the ever-changing world as a never-changing drawing, just like they're doing now. Fuko can't choose and decides that she needs to think about it for a bit. The girl is kind to Fuko and decides that they can take their time so they can just keep having fun. Hours pass and Fuko finally finishes her painting, but she's too shy to show her new friend. Fuko hopes that she won't laugh since she added a lot of stuff to it, but the girl explains that art is all about freedom. Fuko tells her that she shouldn't get too close to her and shows her the painting. The girl begins to say that art has no right or wrong, but is left speechless when she sees it. The girl wonders what all the sparkles around the moon are and Fuko begins her explanation by pointing out that there's nothing up in space except for the moon and the sun. The girl agrees and Fuko goes on to say that she thought the moon looked awfully lonely up there so she gave it some friends. The girl is amazed by Fuko's thoughtfulness and the two agree on how lonely the night sky can be. Fuko then reveals that she has an answer to her question. She reveals that for the longest time she couldn't change and it was so hard on her that she wanted to die. However, four days ago she met this really odd guy and it's been crazy ever since. There have been explosions left and right and next thing she knew she's in Russia. During all that, this guy never once took her 10 years as a shut-in into consideration. Even through all that chaos, he managed to help her change and she thinks that is why she was able to draw with her right now. Fuku had so much fun drawing with her new friend and she explains that she appreciates having someone who changes her and changing in general. In this moment, the girl changes from the bubbly personality she portrayed all day. She marvels at Fuko's lovely words but points out how naive they are. However, despite being extremely naive, those words resonate with her. Fuko has no clue what is going on as the girl is in the water and the girl thinks about how age might have finally caught up to her. This girl clearly has some amazing power as Fuko is in disbelief to see that the lake is floating. The girl stands on top of the floating lake as she puts a suit on and Andy comes rushing out of nowhere. Fuko is looking for answers from him but Andy doesn't say a single word and uses his crimson crescent moon to attack the girl. She easily deflects the attack and is glad to see that Andy, who she calls Daddy Dearest, hasn't changed at all. Our smart mouth hero tells her that she's going overboard with the makeup these days and reveals her name as Gina. He points specifically to her crow's feet and we see that this makes her exceptionally angry. 
Andy makes another perfect five point landing, but Fuka wants him to be serious. She wonders if Gina's the troublesome pink haired girl he told her about earlier, and Andy confirms that it's the chick who captured him 50 years ago. Gina calls for her hat and tells headquarters that she will play with her friends until the scan is done. Gina uses her insanely powerful ability to create stairs and explains that her boss briefed her. She is aware that they want to kill her so they can join the organization. However, she tells her friends Daddy Dearest and Lil Lucky that it won't be that easy and it looks like they will have to change her first. Elsewhere, Shen thinks about how much fun he had fighting undead. His disciple arrives to remind him to focus and she reveals that Gina is about to begin battle with undead and unlock. Shen has gotten to know the pair pretty well and he is sure that they will overcome the great obstacle they face now. Back near the lake, Fuko mounts Andy and Gina rushes to Daddy Dearest as it's been far too long since they last saw each other. Andy removes his sword from his arm and instantly tries to cut her down with his blood. It's clear that he won't be able to cut her that way and Gina can't believe that after 40 years that's all he cares about. Fuko asks her if she's the one that caught Andy 50 years ago and she confirms that she not only caught him but she also supervised him throughout his captivity. Fuko can't believe it since they look the same age and Gina is incredibly flattered. Andy is quick to rain on her parade though as he points out that Gina was 16 when she caught him which means she is 66 now. Andy is amazed by the organization's anti-aging technology but his mouth is instantly shut by Gina's ability. This crazy chick points out that she is 16 internally and uses her ability to force Andy to cut his own face off. As if Gina couldn't get any crazier, she looks right at Andy's cut off face and tries to give it a kiss, but her dreams are crushed when it disappears. Andy realizes that something invisible was covering his mouth, so he will have to figure out a strategy to deal with that. Gina's getting pretty annoyed by how close Lil Lucky is to Andy, so she explains that she was the first to fall in love with him. The female simp then tells the ill-fated story about how they met. She was the hunter and he was the hunted. When she caught him, all the spots were filled on the team so he had to sit in a cell. She eventually apologized for capturing him, but Andy was cool about it and simply said that he got beat fair and square. He was positive as always and said that there were plenty of ways for him to die in his cell. It was a great place for him to learn the rules of his undead ability and told her that they will have a rematch once he escaped. She idolized him to no end, but he escaped 10 years after that without saying a single word to her. He disappeared off the face of the earth for the next 40 years, but he has been popping up everywhere after meeting Fuko. This girl really knows how to talk someone's ear off, but Andy is done listening and introduces her to a few grenades. Gina is completely unharmed and explains that she wanted to be the first to see undead, but is furious that Shen beat her to it. Thickneck was supposed to alert her when he made contact with undead, but he's just a combat crazed lunatic. Gina calms her psychotic mind as she is grateful that Shen brought Void along with him. Thanks to Void's death, a seat has been opened up and now Andy can finally join the team, alone. Andy seems not to be listening to a single word that she says as he tosses a flashbang and charges right at her. Unfortunately, she still managed to keep her barrier up. Andy must chop off his own leg to avoid a terrifying attack and Fuko wonders if they should just run. Running away hasn't even crossed Andy's mind though and he simply says that he is gathering intel. Fuko wonders where Andy's war buddies are but he sadly explains that they are all dead. Andy tells the freaking out Fuko to calm down since he will definitely figure out what Gina negates. For one, Gina solidified the lake. She then telekinetically lifted it up. She is also able to create invisible walls and stairs, which is her main ability. He thinks this means she can harden stuff, but that doesn't explain everything. If she is just hardening stuff, then his sword skills should be able to slice through. Andy tries to do his finger shooting thing, but they never reach, and Gina uses her extremely dangerous spinning hat to slice him in half. It's pretty bad, but Andy notices something about the big old hat. Gina points out that Andy could have dodged if he wasn't so worried about the girl and thinks their fight would be way better right now if Lil Lucky died before. As she does something weird to Andy's midsection, she reveals that she was the one that attacked them with her crazy powerful space projectiles. Our hero who can't seem to keep his clothes on has been restrained and Gina points out that he won't be able to run away from her anymore. Gina wants him to just give up on helping Fuko and begins to explain that she won't be able to fill her quota. Andy interrupts her before she can explain and says that whether it's fate or not, Fuko is his. Fuko goes red and Andy explains that he ain't letting her die until he does. Gina proves to be even more of a lunatic than Andy and says that she will just have to take his head like she did 50 years ago, then he will be hers forever. Andy prepares to take off and explains to the very concerned Fuko that he has figured out what Gina negates. Andy then shocks everyone as this crazy son of a gun shoves a grenade in his mouth and uses his parts bullet attack on his own head to launch it sky high. 
He instantly regenerates his entire body, only to blow it up one second later. The jaws of both girls drop to the ground to see this maniac blow up his own body, causing blood to rain down from the sky. Andy reveals that Jean is able to negate an object's change in form. All her invisible attacks have been negating the change in the air itself. However, covered in all his blood, it's as clear as day. Fuku just manages to catch Andy's severed head and he reveals that Gina's ability is called Unchange. He is correct, but Gina points out that he can't do anything about it. Andy explains that he isn't alone though and regenerates himself inside of Fuku's shirt. Andy determines that those giant hands Gina uses are a result of her fixing the air in place. He is right again and Gina explains that not even he can slip from their grasp once they take hold. Andy knows he can't get to her, but they are not out of options. He tells Fuko to cover as much surface area as she can, but this makes Gina furious, as it's no way for a girl to act in public. She realizes now that Fuko has seduced undead with her womanly ways. She couldn't figure out why Andy would keep such a weak girl around, but everything is clear now. The very bitter Gina tells Fuko that she won't be able to keep her figure after 20 years, but that's not a problem for herself as she has the unchange ability. Andy knows that she is full of it though and points out that Gina is an external targeter. There are two types of negators, self-targeters who can only use their powers on themselves and external targeters who affect anyone other than themselves. Gina tries to say that she is a self-targeter and uses her youthful, unchanging appearance as proof. Our boy is ruthless though and points out that Gina actually just kicks on a bunch of makeup to make her seem younger, but she can't hide how badly parts of her body are beginning to sag. It's also pretty clear that her ability works on everything but living organisms. Gina has completely lost her cool at this point and slices off Andy's legs. This isn't really a problem for the human blood rocket as it's how he gets around anyway. Andy antagonizes her a whole bunch more and thinks about how dodging her arms is way easier when he can see them. It's become pretty clear to him that her invisible arms need time to generate, but the real issue is figuring out how to take down her invincible barrier of air. Fuku is shocked to see that Andy smoothly got himself in a more advantageous position and explains that she realized something about Gina. Gina is clearly very upset, but for some reason she's just speed walking towards them, when running would be way more efficient. Andy thanks his shirt roommate as he just figured out how to get to Gina. First they will have to find a seed for Fuku's unluck, but their flight is stopped when they bump into something invisible. Gina explains that they are getting in the way of the investigation and beams start shooting from the sky. The organization is investigating a UMA, so she has been running a scan of the lake using her ability to split up and harden it into chunks. She was reluctantly doing it so she could meet her quota. Gina has had her fill though and decides that they should wrap up. She then explains that the prey that replaces the UMA will be Lil Lucky. Gina then reveals that a giant spacecraft was there the entire time. She points out how Fuku said that she liked change and reiterates that she hates change. Gina wishes more than anything that she could be the person she was 50 years ago and wants to be with the person she loves forever. She vows to remain in the organization forever so she can keep chasing him forever. She explains that death is the biggest change a person can make, so if that's what Andy wants so bad then he will have to do it over her dead body. Gina goes in for a ferocious attack and manages to do some serious damage. Andy reveals that he actually agrees with the psycho. To be born and to die, these greatest forms of change sound so awesome to him. Andy removes his leg to use his gross ability and explains that death is all his, not Fuko's. As if to make her more mad, Andy explains that he will make sure to keep Fuko alive. Then he will woo her over and over till she falls head over heels for him. Fuko will change her heart. Then they will seal the deal and he will change his mortality. Gina explains that he's being far too optimistic. Joining the organization is a painful and hollow ordeal so Fuko would never last. Andy must then dodge a dangerous attack and he reveals to Fuko that he realized that there is a hole in the barrier beneath Gina's feet. She wouldn't be able to walk around otherwise. If he can slip through the hole then he can beat her with the unlock he has been charging up this whole time. The hole is tiny though, he can tell from the blood trail from the barrier dragging along the ground. At best he will only be able to squeeze his head inside but even then she would just kick him right out. He has an idea though so they put it into action. He starts by launching his sword at her. He then uses the force to slice off his hands. Andy showers her with blood and shocks Gina when his sword slides under her barrier. The pair then use the sword to lift the hole. Fuko gets some distance and Tom Brady's Andy's head straight through it. Andy knows that unluck occurring outside her barrier probably won't take her down, even if it summoned a meteorite. However, he is inside her barrier now, so the unluck that kills him will come inside with him. Since her barrier is composed of air, light passes through just fine, just like when he used a flashbang. 
That means that the unluck will have to be light based, and he was touching Fuku for a long time so it will be huge. We then see that the giant floating ship's weapon has been activated and it unleashes a powerful death beam. The destruction is incredible and the floating body of water collapses. Fuku realizes that Gina's power has been released and rushes to find them. Gina's in pretty bad shape and Andy ruthlessly plans to end her. Gina has accepted her fate and Fuku arrives shocked. Andy explains that he chose not to put her out of her misery and she doesn't have much longer anyway. Fuku is stunned but Gina explains that she was prepared for the worst when she joined the fight. She then finally concedes that she wanted change. She was at the Union's mercy, she was at their beck and call. She has captured and executed so many people and yet not a single thing changed. Not the world and definitely not herself. She thought that their mission was to prevent change in the world. Gina believed that that was her life's mission but now thinks she was wrong. She sadly states that she thought Fuku's painting was so beautiful. It made her see things she never thought she could. Her condition is only getting worse so she tells the two to leave. The anti-aging is starting to wear off and she doesn't want to be seen in such a hideous state. She tells them not to worry about their seats in the union since they are as good as in. Andy, never one to listen, takes Gina in his arms. She tells him to stop as she is embarrassed about how she looks and doesn't want the closeness now that she looks this way. Andy calls her a foolish girl though and tells her that a few wrinkles aren't going to change how beautiful she is. They hold each other closer and share an intimate moment. Afterwards, our heroes mourn Gina's tragic death and Andy explains that she always had a death wish. She would always put up a tough act, but every time she would come to his cell, she would express how she hesitated to end people's lives. She would always say that she was probably better off dead. Andy would joke about putting her on his hit list when he got out and she would always get excited about it. Looking back now, he realizes that she was serious and he thanks Fuku for granting Gina her wish. Fuku is still upset and wants Andy to make a promise that they will try to change things so no one else suffers like Gina did. She desperately wants to change Union so her enthusiastic protagonist agrees to do it and says it will help make Fuku fall in love with him too. Fuku begins to wonder if they can really do it but our boy is already planning it out. He explains that the Union will be arriving at any time so their first order of business will be to scope out the Union's hideout from the inside. They prepare to have a toast for Gina, but a horrifying creature emerges from a portal, stating that it has come to pick them up. It came much sooner than Andy expected, so the two find themselves falling right into the Union's meeting room. Fuku is shocked to see Andy chomping down on his own fingers, but he just explains that he's saying hello. Andy wants to end all of them at once with his finger bullets, but these Union members are not to be messed with as they are completely unharmed. Our duo land in their seats where Andy explains that everyone would have saved a whole bunch of time if they all just dropped dead right then. Our favorite tree trunk neck Shen points out to everyone how interesting the two are just like he told them they would be and the member named Yu is welcomes them. The two are finally going to have their drink but Andy is instantly obliterated by a robot mega punch of death. The punch came from Tatiana, a robot who is clearly furious as she is practically hyperventilating. The gun wielder named Billy tries to calm her down but she can't contain her rage as she points out that these two killed Gina. She wants Andy to pay but Billy reminds her that fighting among members is forbidden. Andy is glad to see at least one of them has a temper and we see that he managed to somehow get an attack in while being punched as Tatiana's hand falls apart but she easily repairs it. Yuwiz demands that they stop and Tatiana aims her weapon at Billy against her will. Andy aims his sword at Fuku's neck and can't understand how his arm is acting on its own. Yuwiz is clearly the one doing it as Tatiana begs her to stop as she doesn't want to end Billy's life, although Billy's confident he won't die. Andy can clearly tell that this person is powerful and agrees not to fight with them as long as she stops her ability. She stops and Andy apologizes for putting Fuku through that but explains that they got some very valuable information from it. It's time to begin so U.S. calls upon Apocalypse, a psychotic looking book with ravenous teeth that's excited to see fresh blood. U.S. refocuses the bloodthirsty book so it does its job and reveals that there are six quests this time. The first quest is the capture of the unidentified mysterious animal or UMA called Burn and their reward is the addition of an 11th seat. The second quest is the capture of the UMA Eat and the reward is the location of the negator Unburn. The third quest is for the neutralization of the UMA called Language with the reward of the unification of all world languages. Fuku is completely lost at this point and Andy tells her that they are just gathering intel at this point so she should just try to retain as much of the conversation as possible. The fourth quest is for the capture of the negator Unseen with the reward of the location of the UMA named Call. Quest 5 is the capture of the UMA called Past and the reward is the location of something called Artifact Rebellion. 
The final quest is for the capture of a UMA named Spoil, with the reward being the location of Negator Unrepair. The book explains that they have until August 31st. If all quests are not fulfilled, the penalty will be the addition of UMA Galaxy. Fuku is just as lost as I am, but Andy tells her to just keep paying attention. The member named Nico runs an analysis and uses the information gathered by their investigators to determine that the first three quests are the ones they can actually accomplish. He recommends that Burn should take the highest priority since the reward of adding an 11th seat is most worthwhile. Beyond that, they should definitely give up on the last one called Spoil. They are severely lacking in information on Spoil, so they would only end up losing members. Yuuz decides that they will focus all their power on the first three quests. They will focus on strengthening their forces this time and just take the penalty for failing to do the final quest. Fuko takes it upon herself and asks the member named Top what the crazy looking book even is. Top explains that Apocalypse is the first artifact found on Earth. When negators sit in every seat at the round table, it opens and forces a bunch of difficult tasks on them. If they clear the quest, then they get a reward, but if they fail, they get hit with a penalty. Fuko questions if it's really worth doing if they just end up getting hurt, and points out to everyone how even Gina felt like nothing ever changed. One of the quests was to capture a negator, so Fuko fears that they are going to treat someone else like they treated Andy and herself. She points out that they are all just normal people aside from having insane abilities, and just wants it all to stop. Yui stops her and states that rules have been added to Earth 98 times. Language, race, death, sickness are just a tiny few examples. Once every three months, new penalties are added even without their invention. That is why they intervene. Their forces need to be strong enough to complete these quests. So to accomplish this, they capture and utilize those with power. By gaining the rewards, they will grow in strength. So that someday, the one forcing these rules upon Earth, the god residing on the other side of the book, can be executed. She goes on to say that they must try to keep all seats at the table filled so they have backups ready. Unluck and Undead were too dangerous to leave unchecked, so she had no other choice but to order their disposal. However, because of Shen's recommendation, she has invited them both there. Unluck is still hesitant, so Yu explains that if Fuko wants to change things, then she will simply have to become number one in the group. Leadership of the Union is bestowed upon the person who has achieved the most results. If she works hard enough, then she can take her spot. Our boy Andy has had enough of all the sitting and talking, so he shocks everyone as he just walks straight up to the book. He opens it up and demands that it tell him which of the quests is the hardest. Shen has a good laugh as the book snacks on Andy's hands, and it reveals that the most difficult quest is the last one, the one that requires capturing spoil. The quest requires three participants, but Andy isn't afraid of anything. He is actually more excited than ever, so he tells the book that his team will include Fuko and our boy Shen. The quest is accepted by Apocalypse, and Shen is left shocked. Afterward, Shen's subordinate named Mui helps Fuko put on her uniform. Fuko tries to warn her that it's dangerous to touch her, but Mui isn't worried one single bit. Mui congratulates her on officially becoming a member at the round table after accepting their first quest, and explains that valuable rewards await her upon succeeding. Mui explains that she can't tag along since she doesn't possess an emblem, and she is neither a negator nor a member of the round table. No emblem means no participating in quests, so she asks Fuko to look after Shen in her place. Outside the dressing room, Andy is running through the hall as he is being chased by Shen, who is telling him to at least put clothes on since Andy is refusing to suit up. Unfortunately, he accidentally touches Fuko, and her unluck causes a small disaster. Shen wonders where Andy's suit went, and he explains that it was burned to ashes by the magma that came bursting out of the walls. Andy couldn't care less about wearing stupid clothes and just wants to get the quest started already. Shen is far more reasonable than our nudist protagonist and explains that Annie needs a suit, necktie, and emblem. It may look like cosplay, but a member's suit is very impressive. The necktie grants access to any number of public services and it has the ability to translate any language. The emblem itself is necessary to participate in quests. The suits are bulletproof, stab proof, and just sturdy in general. They will have to travel all around the world to investigate spoil, so the uniform will make things much easier. And he has literally no interest in anything Shen is saying, and explains that all he needs is his helicopter. Our two heroes finally aren't being hunted, so Andy wants to take Fuko on a date in the clouds, leaving Shen all on his own. Shen thinks they should move as a unit, but that would only cramp Andy's style. Just then, an alarm goes off, and it is explained that a prisoner UMA has taken over a member of personnel and escaped. All members are ordered to capture it, and Top is super excited to get some points. Yumi investigates and realizes that the timing is perfect since the prisoner is the garment UMA called clothes. This UMA latches onto a person's body and transforms into the garments that the person most desires. However, once it does, it takes control of the person's body and starts running wild. 
The thing instantly appears to break Andy's neck, but Andy blasts it with a headbutt powered by the force from repairing his neck. Andy explains that he just knocked it out, but Mui says there is a problem. When the body that the prisoner has taken over loses the capacity to move, it will seek out a new one. This thing in the blink of an eye jumps onto Mui. Andy doesn't notice any change in her clothes, but Shen can tell that they are different. Mui begins attacking them, so our undead hero wonders why Shen isn't constricting her. Nexilla explains that his powers would definitely work on Mui, but the attacks are coming from the clothes, and clothes don't meet his ability's requirements. Our boy has a good laugh as he tells Shen that his ability is useless, but Shen is quick to remind him that his ability beat him in their last fight. Andy points out that their fight never really finished, so they decide to handle unfinished business afterwards. It's clear to Fuko that Mui is suffering a lot, having to attack Shen, who she cares a great deal about, so she decides to take action. Fuko touches Mui with her bare hands and apologizes to her. She knows they just met, but something had to be done, and she tells Mui to get ready as her unluck is coming. An unlucky brick knocks Mui out cold as she thanks Fuko. The Yuume is headed towards Fuko, which she expected since she noticed that the thing prefers female targets. However, our human blood rocket notices as well and rescues her. Andy is upset that she did something so reckless, but Fuko knew she could count on him to come to her rescue. Andy points out how dangerous her unluck would be under someone else's control, but she didn't even think of that. Mui wakes up to apologize for hurting the one person that saved her life before, but Shen just compliments her on her sweet kung fu moves. He encourages her to keep training, and she is overwhelmed with emotion. None of them can understand what's going on, as the UMA attached to Andy, but it's not turning into clothes. This thing starts to speak, and it's apparently infuriated by what Andy desires as clothes. This is because it read his mind, and Andy wants sturdy clothes that regenerate when ripped and rush over when called for. It's a lot to ask for, but Andy just calls the thing lame for whining so much. The funny piece of clothing refuses to be insulted, and tells Andy to get prepared, since once he entrances him with its creation, Andy will become its walking mannequin puppet. Fuko realizes in this moment that she just touched Andy a second ago, and the unluck hasn't come yet. It finally does, and Andy's body is absolutely disintegrated by a beam of light. Nico apologizes from down below for the accident he caused while working with the other member named Phil. Andy has already regenerated, but tells his new suit that it took too long to regenerate, so it needs to work on getting faster. Fuko names it Clothy, and Clothy is furious that it can't control Andy, because Andy is unhappy with how slow it regenerates. Shen is amazed that they managed to make the UMA their servant, but Andy explains that he really isn't too happy about having to be clothed. It's announced to everyone that the UMA has been captured by Undead, and Top is furious that his teammate Ishin was too slow. Undead is awarded points, and that promotes him to 9th in the Union. Just then, it is revealed that there have been witness reports of a new UMA. There is confirmation of a rotting corpse wandering the streets of New York, and it is believed that there is connection to the UMA named Spoil that was mentioned in the quests. Andy is excited to be going to the good old US of A, since he is tired of how small burgers are in Japan, and Fuko is just shocked that burgers are different overseas. Sometime later, we find our heroic duo in Nevada, USA. Andy decided against taking his helicopter and opted to hit the road instead. He wonders if they should just head to Vegas to party it up, but Fuko reminds him about their quest. There has been a confirmed case of a rotting corpse wandering the streets of New York, so there was a memory wipe of all witnesses. The rotting corpse was identified and it was discovered that he was from a town called Longing. Just then, Fuko is shocked out of her mind when Shen appears with his giant neck and explains that Longing is a rural area in the US. Shen cleverly attached himself to the truck a long time ago, but was starting to get lonely. Fuko begs him to come inside, which moves Shen to tears, so he releases himself. Inside, Fuko wonders if the rotting corpse in New York really has to do with the guy they are hunting named Spoil. Shen defines the word spoil as when something decays or rots away. He has no clue why it traveled 4,000 kilometers to get to New York, but he is sure that the enemy they are looking for will be in Longing. The UMA spoil and his legion of homemade zombies. Fuko is terrified, but Shen explains that their investigators scoped out the town ahead of time and sent them an audio clip from when they set up a barricade. She wonders if the investigators made it out okay, but she becomes even more terrified when he doesn't answer. Instead, he just plays the horrifying audio clip. In it, the investigators encounter the walking dead and become frantic when they start coming after them. The investigators tried to fight back, but they were overwhelmed. They can be heard screaming in agony just as the clip is cut off. Fuko is left shaking in fear, and Nexilla wants to hear Undead's opinion on the situation. Shen points out that Andy will have to go all out against this enemy, or they will lose, but Andy isn't the least bit afraid. That night, Shen can tell that Fuko is having a hard time sleeping, so he tells her not to worry since he and Andy will take care of spoil. However, Fuko reveals that she wants to help. 
Shen assumes that it's to earn points to help Gina's cause, but that isn't it. She actually wants to help because of the reward they will get from capturing Spoil. The reward is the location of the UMA known as Unrepair. Fuko hopes that this Unrepair person might be able to give them a clue that will help Andy finally die like he has always wanted. Fuko wonders why Shen is there, but remembers that he was forced by Andy. Shen acknowledges that that was part of it, but he actually has another reason. This appears to be a very difficult quest, so he hopes that he finally might be able to see someone. Not just the half-hearted version of him that they know. The person that the Union refers to as Victor, God of Victory. The next day, they arrive at Longing, which has been barricaded. Shen and Fuku agree that they should proceed with caution, but our boy Andy has noticed that there is a wall in the way and makes them a nice little entrance with a rocket launcher. This of course attracts all the zombies, and Shen points out that that wall was supposed to contain them. Andy closes his window shut and asks Shen if the zombies can be reverted back to human form. It's impossible for them to become human again, so this just excites Andy, as he doesn't have to hold back. Andy tells Fuko to brace herself and borrows Truck Kun's immense power to Isekai the Horde of Zombies. Andy keeps his endless intensity going as he goes flying through the windshield to slice off some of his own limbs. He lands right at the center of a huge crowd of zombies and explains that he's going to finish them all off. However, he explains that if one of these zombies still has enough brain left in them to tell him who did this to them, then they should duck down right about now since he wants to have a chat with them. The human blood rocket then spins himself at crazy speeds and slices off the top parts of all the zombies. However, Andy sees that one of them actually ducked down and he's glad to see that not everyone has been completely spoiled. Andy has this one zombie hilariously follow him to the truck and tells his team that all they have to do is have her lead them to spoil. Fuko is ready to tag along, but Shen stops her and reminds them that they should be proceeding with caution. Shen asks if Andy has any experience fighting UMAs, but our absent-minded hero can't remember fighting any. Shen explains that UMAs are different from negators like themselves. UMAs are the very rules themselves. It's common for them to suddenly ensnare people without rhyme or reason. Shen then reveals that his ability activates when he looks at his target from a certain distance. Fuko's activates when she makes physical contact. Shen assumes that knowing Andy, he was simply planning to figure out how Spoil's ability worked mid-combat. However, that is a terrible idea against UMAs. Shen then shockingly reveals that it's very likely that the UMA has already activated its ability. Most UMAs will impose the rule on anyone who steps within their range, with no exceptions. Andy apologizes for putting them in unnecessary danger, which actually surprises Thickneck. Andy explains that he doesn't feel anything different, but the zombie and Clothie both point out that he has something written on his stomach. Andy causes a lot of pain to Clothie when he rips apart his shirt and reveals that there is some sort of countdown on his body. Clothie is kind of a jerk as he laughs at Andy and states that he is as good as dead now. Fuko and Shen are free of any marks though, so Shen determines that Andy must have landed straight in the center of Spoil's target area. Fuko is super worried about him and frantically tries to think of what they should do, but Andy is totally fine with just waiting around till he spoils to death. His loyal teammates freak out, but Andy explains that if something this small could take him out, then he would have been dead a long time ago. A while later, Andy's countdown reaches zero and his arm starts rotting. Luckily, he is able to regenerate it, but it instantly begins rotting again. Shen determines that it's a pesky continuous effect type, and we see that Andy's face is beginning to spoil as well. It's clear now that the moment someone sets foot in the town, Spoil curses them. When that person hits the curse's time limit, they automatically get zombified. This quest is proving to be quite difficult, especially since their only lead is a brainless zombie that is lacking communication skills. Just then, Andy is somehow able to understand what the zombie is saying, and she tells him something about what she wants in exchange for information. Andy tells his team the good news, but then shocks them as he picks the zombie girl up. Fuko wants to know what he is doing, so Andy reveals that he's going to get married to the zombie. He assumes that he can understand her because he is half zombie now, and explains that this is the only way she will tell them where Spoil is. Our boy Andy is a real stand-up guy though, as he asks Fuko if it's okay. He explains that if Fuko would consider it cheating, then he would turn down the zombie's proposal. Shen can't believe the ridiculous situation and points out that it could be a trap. Fuko is having a great time though and actually encourages Andy to walk the zombie girl down the aisle. Shen tries to stop him but it's too late and he is already on his way to find his bride-to-be a wedding dress. Before he leaves though, Shen reminds him that they're only supposed to capture their target. If he kills Spoil then they will fail the quest and they don't get any do-overs. Just then, Fuko notices some kid pop out of the ground like a mole and he freaks out when he sees adults. Shen finishes up yelling at Andy by telling him to contact them when he finds Spoil and he doesn't even notice when Fuko dirts off after the boy. 
It's clear that Andy didn't listen to a single thing he said, so Shin asks his dear disciple Mui for the strength to go on. Underground, Fuko goes after the boy and tries to tell him that she isn't a zombie. She wonders why the boy isn't zombified, but doesn't think for long as she determines that she needs to save him. Shen eventually finds her and points out how similar she is to Undead, since neither of them consider the consequences of their actions. Shen warns her not to go further since they are in Spoil's range, and he assumes that the boy will be zombified. The kid then shockingly reappears with a gun and tells them that they are right. He shows his timer and explains that his entire group is cursed. Shen analyzes the situation and wonders why the kid has more digits than Andy had. Fuko tries to tell them that they are not going to hurt them, but the kid calls her a liar. This kid assumes that they are there to end their lives since they are cursed, and he can't think of any other reason outsiders would come to such a rundown town. The kid explains that the fact that they are standing a safe distance from them is proof enough, but he is shocked when Fuko runs to grab him. She covered most of her skin so her unluck won't affect the boy, but unfortunately for her, she gets cursed. I guess Shen doesn't want to feel left out as he intentionally steps forward and gets cursed as well. At her boy's wedding, Andy compliments his future wife on how great she looks. He points out that a priest should be there to say till death do them part, but remembers that they are both spoiling away anyway. We see that these two somehow even have guests at this wedding, and his zombie wife just manages to say the words thank you. Andy says it's no problem, and he urges the crowd to show a little more excitement. The poor zombie girl then explains that her dream was to wear a wedding dress, so that is enough for her. She urges Andy to go and save everyone, all those in misery unable to die. She wants him to put them all to rest. In order to do this, Andy must end the monster that did it, and she points to the statue in front of them. Andy points out that his orders were to capture the thing, but admits that he can't refuse his bride's request. He instantly slices through the statue, and it comes alive. It's furious that Andy won't spoil, and it reveals its true form as a giant monster. This thing is spoiled, and it destroys the entire building. Andy is unharmed though, and he calls the zombies fools for protecting him. He thanks the zombies and gives Spoil a taste of his parts bullet hammer attack. The attack uses a bell to knock the monster back and also makes a loud ringing noise. Andy keeps attacking it with the bell and calls out to all the zombies. He tells them that if they want revenge on the thing that spoiled their bodies, then all they need to do is follow the sound of the bell. Swarms of zombies do exactly that, filling every path towards the monster. Andy gives a smile to his bride as he takes out the sword from his back and he prepares to complete the quest. Back underground, Fuko introduces herself to the boy named Ken. Ken is the oldest in his group, so he feels like he needs to be strong for all his little friends. Fuko explains that they are from Union, and they are there to help the little punks, so Ken tells her what happened. Just one week earlier, a dark ball appeared in the middle of the city and started speaking. Some floating head thing took a liking to the place because it seemed like it would be easy to spoil. It decided to start with the people first, so numbers suddenly appeared on everyone's stomachs. Everyone began turning into zombies, so Ken's teacher, who we see that is Andy's bride, brought them to safety. She left the kids underground, but they were all worried about her. She told them not to worry, even though we see that she was already infected. She told them that she wasn't going to die until she found the great guide to walk her down the aisle. Being the good teacher she is, she told the kids to never forget their dreams, and she bid farewell to them as she was clearly beginning to spoil. Ken is pretty traumatized, but he goes to check on the little girl named Mai as she is crying. Mai's countdown is nearing zero, so Ken does his best to assure her that everything will be okay. He reminds her about her dream to become a florist, and she remembers that she wants to sell sunflowers. Those are the same flowers that their teacher loved, and Mai just wants to give their teacher lots of sunflowers as a surprise. Surprisingly, Mai's countdown, instead of hitting zero, goes way up instead. Ken points out that he told them what happened and just now showed them how to raise the countdown. So now he wants Fuko to help them. Fuko promises to do so, but they begin to hear that something big is happening above them. It's Andy and our boy is busy slicing up spoil. Shen squeezes his giant neck through a door in the ground and has a peek at what's going on. The spoiled humans are trying to get their revenge and are shockingly fighting side by side with Andy. The zombies aren't contributing much to the fight, but Shen assumes that this must be Andy's way of being nice to them. Andy entrusts the safety of his bride-to-be to Shen since the wedding isn't over yet and Ken tells the other little nerds that their teacher is back. He really gets all their hopes up, but Fuko gets really sad when she realizes that a really terrible thing has happened to such a nice person. All the kids greet their now zombified teacher and little Mai wants to bandage up her beloved teacher's arm. Fuko is then shocked when she hears the zombified teacher say thank you. Just then, a dumb zombie bumps into Fuko. She is fine, but she touched the zombie with her skin. 
and he is busy with Spoil, but he notices that the zombie affected by Foucault's unluck manages to have the curse hurt Spoil with a falling sign. Of course, this gives Andy an idea, so he tells all the zombies that they will be changing up their strategy. Andy points to Fuko and tells all the zombies to go touch her. This will essentially turn them all into bombs, so they will be sure to do more damage than what they have been doing so far. Fuko is certain that not even zombies would sacrifice themselves like that, but she is wrong. The kid's teacher doesn't even hesitate to touch her. Fuko tries to fight it at first because it's just too sad, as she knows how nice of a person the teacher is, but she eventually understands. The teacher is willing to sacrifice herself for everyone, so Fuko touches her. Ken just sees his beloved teacher running into danger, so he tries to stop her, but Shen just uses his ability to stop him instead. Fuko warns that her unluck is coming and it's going to be a big one. Andy watched it all and points out that he always knew she was the perfect bride for him. The teacher sadly lets out a scream of determination and imagines sunflowers all around her as she makes her way to Spoil. Spoil takes a hold of her and no one can bear to watch. The big dumb monster falls victim to Fuko's unluck as it trips and falls right on top of a gunpowder shop. The explosion is huge and we sadly see that the teacher's wedding dress is burned away. Ken calls out to his teacher but it's not safe as the fight is not over. Spoil is getting weaker though so Andy unites everyone by telling them it's all of them versus the monster. Fuko refocuses and tells all the zombies to come and get some of this unluck. The large crowd stampedes past her and she does her best to touch as many zombies as she can, applying unluck everywhere. Nexilla has the kids wait in their little hole and sees that Fuko is hard at work applying her unluck. Their plan seems to be working as Spoil is getting bombarded with bad luck and Andy encourages everyone to keep up the intensity. Things are going pretty well but Shen reveals that there is a problem. Both he and Fuko ended up cursed and they need to resolve the issue quickly. Andy is pretty upset but Fuko begs Andy not to blame Shen since it was her fault for rushing out. Andy determines that they have no time to capture Spoil so they have to end its life instead. Shen hates the idea since that would mean they failed the quest and everyone would be furious with him. There is no time left to talk though as Fuko goes airborne when Spoil begins inhaling everything in the city. Luckily our boy is the human blood rocket so he gets them out of danger but the same cannot be said about all the poor zombies. Spoil has consumed it all and it does a transformation thing where it reveals its next form. This thing somehow managed to get even uglier and Shen wonders if Annie has managed to figure out its rules while fighting it. Andy explains that its main body can spoil any organic matter aside from living beings at will. To spoil living things, the timer it puts on them has to reach zero. Things are pretty bad though as Spoil is even more fierce now and it uses an insanely powerful beam that decimates the Statue of Liberty instantly. The monster has no clue why it missed its target so bad but Andy thanks Shen because he somehow did it. Spoil begins to speak as it realizes that because three people have come for him, they must be on a quest. He is upset of course because this means that the book Apocalypse is interfering with his plans. Back at headquarters, Mui tells our group that Spoil's laser attack absolutely decimated anything it touched by eroding it away. The attack exceeded the parameters of the Spoil rule so it's incredibly dangerous and they can't let it hit them at all. Spoil can't understand why they are standing against him since he is simply returning everything to Earth and they should appreciate the beauty in that. The thing attacks with insane speed so the lasers hit both of our heroes. Andy removes his arm to keep from spoiling and Shen just manages to take off his glove. Shen mourns the loss of his difficult to order glove and Andy determines that the attack only works on individual parts. If it hits a live body, it's an instant game over. This means that dragging the fight out will put him at a severe disadvantage. Andy decides to make it quick but he is shocked when his body begins to spoil before even touching the thing. Spoil knocks him right out of the air and pummels him into the ground. While taking a beating, Andy realizes that living things spoil just by getting close to it. Spoil sees how tough it is to hurt Andy and realizes that Andy is the death negator. This is of course annoying for Spoil, but he is not concerned. Spoil states that given the rate of its decay in its second form, it doubts that Andy's regeneration can keep up. Spoil leaves Andy to rot away and turns its attention to Fuko and Shen. Spoil talks like the typical psychopathic bad guy and tells the two that they should be grateful. Spoil says that his birth has brought with it a beautiful circle of life and they will have the pleasure of indulging in it while they are still alive. Things are getting pretty intense but Shen gets an idea and starts running away. He tells the others that he's just stepping away for a second but Spoil says that running away is futile. Even if Shen runs far beyond its area of attack, the timer will remain. Spoil continues its crazy talk by saying that the world before its birth was so stagnant. Everything grew uglier and uglier without decay so he brought about change in the form of Spoil. 
Thanks to him, living things started fighting to remain longer. They used their brains and they grew from it. This thing is kind of starting to make sense, and he explains that it's a necessary rule. Spoil points out that the humans are the only beings who reject him, labeling him as an evil entity. As these two have a nice little chat, we see that Andy is trying to recover. Spoil can't understand why he is rejected by them, and he points out that humans get so attached to a body that won't even last a century on its own. Foucault has an answer for this monster and says that it's because humans have dreams. People simply live with the bodies they were born with and use them to accomplish their dreams. Foucault is defiant now and says that she's not going to let some rule that it made wreck any of that. Even if her body were to spoil because of him, she has a dream. Because of that, her heart will never spoil away. Foucault's dream is to become a normal girl and live her life to the fullest. Until that happens, she will never give up. Revealing her dream causes the timer to go up drastically and Spo has no clue what is going on. Foucault rushes off to Andy and Andy admires how sick what she did was. Shen returns to praise her as well and we see that he went to get his staff. He then gives Spo a powerful smack on its head. Shen reveals his dream to become the greatest in all of creation. His number reaches 10,000 and begins climbing even higher. Shen gives Spoil a good whack to the head, but Andy warns him not to get too close or he will begin spoiling. Old Thickneck isn't worried at all though, since he realized that Spoil put his face really close to Fuko earlier and nothing happened. This means that its Spoil field only surrounds its body, and he is weak when he extends his head. That's okay though, since Shen has his staff called Neo Kinko that is able to extend. Andy wishes he would have used it sooner, but Shen explains that he only realized he could use it thanks to Andy. This bow staff was excavated in China and can expand and contract at will. Shen approaches the beast, but Spoil states that he isn't going to just stand around and be hit. Shen does land an attack though, and Spoil can't understand why his body's moving towards Shen on its own. Shen attacks again and we learn that his ability acts on a target in his field of vision. It forces his target to perform the opposite of any action it was trying to make. Spoil's dumb brain can't figure out what's going on though, so he tries to retreat, but Shen's ability makes him walk right into another attack instead. Any conscious thought that enters the target's mind is negated by Shen. However, to activate this ability, Shen must become fond of his target. This is great and all, but Andy still has no clue how they are supposed to capture giants like this. Nexilla explains that there is a core inside of its body, but any living being will spoil if it gets close to it. Spoil is getting tired of getting wrecked and tries to attack, but again Shen's ability stops him. This Spoil thing is insanely powerful since it has an ability that spoils anything that gets close, and it's more powerful than Andy's regeneration. On top of that, it has a disintegration laser for distant targets. Spoil is getting really irritated now as he refuses to believe that a puny human could have such control over him with just a glance. Unfortunately for him, it's true, but Shen is happy for another reason. This monster's strength will be the reason he finally gets to see the person he has been waiting for. Our heroes try to think of a way to stop Spoil and realize that spoiling happens because of bacteria in the air. However, bacteria need moisture. Andy comes up with the idea to decrease the moisture around Spoil and decides to create an explosion. He touches Fuko's exposed belly and she tells him that her gut is only hanging out because she had a big meal earlier. Andy plans to use the gunpowder shop to blow Spoil up but Fuko's unluck is unpredictable and he falls through a crack in the ground instead. Spoil creates a dust cloud by destroying buildings and Shen realizes that the monster is obstructing Shen's vision to counter his ability. Seemingly just forgetting about our boy Andy, Fuko comes up with a different plan. She points out that there is no moisture in space so nothing could spoil out there. Fuko wonders if they can use the Union spaceship to take spoil up there but she realizes that they wouldn't survive the trip either. Shen seems to think it's a good idea though and shockingly states that he can somehow lift spoil and another passenger up to space. This other passenger would be Andy as we see that he is totally fine. The only problem with the plan is that Andy would have to endure Spoil's ability until they reach space since they will be traveling together. Spoil did major damage to Andy earlier but Shen wonders if Andy's old self could endure it. A look back shows how Andy keeps a card in his head to keep 100 years worth of memories bottled up. Andy agrees to Shen's plan but gives him some stipulations. Shen sends down his staff and has Mui give him the coordinates of the hidden monster. Mui tells them but thinks that they should all run away as Spoil is preparing a large attack. Andy receives the coordinates though and extends the staff. He launches himself and Spoil straight into the sky and removes the card from his skull. The staff just keeps on extending and the two eventually end up in space. Fuko is shocked that Andy removed his card since he said that he would go off the rails whenever he did. 
Shen knows this well but he is actually excited to witness the power of the man who once brought victory to countless battlefields. In space, Spool thinks that their plan is silly. In Spoil's current form, he not only has spoilage at his disposal, he also has a beam that disintegrates anything it touches. The monster destroys half of Andy's face but it instantly regenerates and Andy's hair turns black. Spoil is stunned by the new regeneration speed but that isn't even the craziest part. Andy uses an attack he calls Division Bullets. His normal finger bullets regenerate into more Andy's. Spoil has no clue what is going on but the fight is instantly over as Andy's clones decimate him. Black haired Andy wants to have a little fun and sends Spool's head down with his arm. Back on Earth, Mui has made some preparations. Shen tells the kids to walk in a certain direction so they can get picked up by the organization. Shen and Fuko still have work to do there so he leaves the protection of all the kiddos to Ken. The kids begin their journey so Shen assures Fuko that they will be okay because of Mui's preparations. Just then, Andy's little present comes crashing down from space. Andy uses his insane ability and regenerates himself completely from just his hand. Black haired Andy is victorious but Shen very seriously tells Fuko to stand back. Shen has Mui beam up Spoil's core and Andy asks what year and month it is. Shen tells him but Andy wants to know what day it is. Shen is shocked as it's less like Andy's memories came back and more like he has become a different person altogether. Black haired Andy's head begins to ache and he becomes furious. He is clearly talking to the Andy we know inside his head as he tells him that he has already had his turn. Black hair Andy thinks real Andy has wasted their life and realizes that it's all Fuko's fault. He tells Shen to get out of the way and Shen reveals this version of Andy as the god of victory called Victor. Victor has no clue how Shen knows about him but doesn't care and instantly kicks him in the face. Shen is stunned since he activated his ability and even read the trajectory of Victor's strike. Victor's strength is unreal but Shen seems to be happier than ever. Victor is so strong that his own limbs break with every attack. Humans unconsciously exercise a level of control for self-preservation but Victor has broken free from this restriction. Victor is impressed with Shen especially since he only has one life to work with and he uses several finger bullets on him. Shen is in terrible shape so Fuko tries to use her unluck on Victor. Surprisingly, even though her unluck has never failed before, nothing happens this time. Victor seems to realize something and Shen tells Mui to relay a message. Victor used Andy's knowledge to determine how Fuko's unlock works and explains that it fluctuates based on how much he likes a person. Victor looks menacing as he explains that he would never fall victim to such a pitiful ability. Victor tells Andy to give up since he can't be killed and threatens to send him into despair by eliminating Fuko. Fuko flips it on this dude and tells Andy that the two of them still have a lot left to do. They were supposed to travel, do all kinds of things and then fall in love. There are even greater strokes of unluck to uncover so he has to come back and keep his promise. Nothing happens though and Victor calls her a fool. He explains that rules are absolute and things won't change no matter what happens. Shen interrupts his little speech though and points out that humans have immense potential. He concedes that he has lost but he is sure that this fight will make him stronger in the long run. Shen would like to fight more but unfortunately he is too weak now. He proclaims that all that is left for him to do now is to hurry up and honor his two promises that he made to Andy. Thick Neck spins his body at ridiculous speeds and announces his first promise to protect Fuko. He lands a powerful attack but knows in his mind that he is at best just stalling for time. Shen's other promise to Andy was to defeat him. Shen won't be able to do it himself but the sky breaks open and we see that he called on the other members of the Union. The other members call Andy a very troublesome rookie and Shen assures Fuko that he is in good hands. Victor is insane though and fears nothing. He is actually excited to see that he has a total of 10 opponents. He uses all his finger bullets but each member has a shield. Victor demands that they attack and stop only defending. The gun wielding maniac fires a shot that ricochets off all the shields and Victor realizes that this was their plan. Victor blows it all up though and gets even more excited. Nico slices him in half and Victor is surprised when he can't regenerate. Nico is apparently some kind of genius as he points out that Victor's regeneration slows considerably when the cut sections are burned. Nico then reveals a bit of history as he points out that he didn't do a bunch of tests on Andy's body for 10 years for nothing. Victor compliments him on the attack and points out that it would definitely be effective on Andy. Victor is a completely different beast though and he explains that he can regenerate wherever he wants. Whenever his body is no longer good, he can just switch to his finger. Ishin destroys his old body but Victor is unimpressed since Ishin only used brute force. 
There was nothing else behind the swing, so Victor determines that Ishin is an amateur at combat. He tells Ishin to stay out of his way and he will spare Ishin from death. Victor faces the others and has a good laugh. He says that it's a shame what happened to Gina, but he is excited since all of them seem like they will put up a good fight. Everyone then prepares for a fight, the union leader included. The fight instantly begins as Yu is attacks Victor, but he is incredibly strong. She manages to slice them in half and uses this moment to tell Top to get Fuku and the injured Shen out of there. Victor is severely outnumbered, but he uses his division bullets to create several copies of himself. Top follows orders and one Victor clone is impressed with the kid since he used his negation ability to his advantage. The insane battle rages on and Chen has his gigantic staff shrink. Once it shrinks, Top jumps over the barrier to escape with Shen and Fuko. Fuko thanks Top for rescuing them, but he explains that there is no thanks necessary since they are on the same team now. Fuku is still very grateful, but she wonders why this kid won't stop moving. Top explains that there really is no plan to stop Victor, and they only managed to do it last time because they had old lady Gina with them. Fuku is certain that she can get through to Andy and asks Top to take her back to him. Top is quick to point out that the guy back there nearly ended her life and he isn't the same guy anymore. Fuku isn't listening to the kid and just tells Shen to give her Andy's brain card. Shen first gives her a gun to protect herself as he doesn't want Andy to get mad at him for not thinking about her safety. Top is stunned to see that Shen believes in her as he gives her the card and she begins running back. Top wants Shen to talk some sense into her, but Shen explains that if Fuko were that easy to stop, then she wouldn't be alive today. Top realizes that there is no stopping her, so he goes to pick her up. Fuko thanks him for helping her and he just hopes that she has a plan. She formally introduces herself and Top is shocked that this little brat wants to get acquainted at a time like this. He introduces himself and she calls him the real brat since he's only 15 years old. The two argue for a bit and we get a hilarious view of Shen just hanging out. Back at the war, Victors are getting destroyed left and right and Victor finds out just how sturdy Ishin is. Phil uses an insanely powerful beam to decimate one of the Victors, but Ishin is completely unharmed. Victor determines that Ishin must have some sort of hardening ability and the kid with lasers must have a body completely made up of artifacts. The kid blasts away and we see that one of the Victors is fighting their leader. Yuiz has a flaming sword and Victor instantly realizes that it's the work of the UMA Burn. Top returns with Fuko and is stunned when he sees how many Victors there are. Fuko had no clue he could even do that, but Top says it's a huge problem. They can't even tell them apart and there's no way to tell which is the main one. Victor is challenging every single Union member, but Fuko somehow determines that the one fighting the boss contains the real Andy. Top says he looks just like all the others, but Fuku points out that he is the only one with a katana. Besides that, she can see remnants of clothing on him, so she tells Top to take her to him. Victor is busy fighting the boss, but is instantly stunned when Fuku jumps on him. Everyone else is stunned as well, since Fuku decided to go skin to skin with him. The other Victors burst, but Top still has his doubts about her plan. Fuku simply says maybe it might work, and we see that Top still can't stop moving. Everyone is just spectating now and Fuku explains that if she stays latched onto him in this way, no matter how much she dislikes him, a big stroke of unluck is sure to come eventually. Once he gets nice and weak, all she will have to do is stick the card back into his brain. Yu is once a time frame on how long it will take, but Fuku has no clue. She has never clung on to someone she has hated for long. If it were Andy, then the stroke of unluck would come quickly, so Yu is decides to change the plan. She ignites her sword and tells Fuko that she will have to bring back Andy's personality for a split second. If Fuko can impart her unluck on him in that moment, then they might be able to win. Victor is insulted and explains that he is actually the original. Andy is putting up quite the fight inside of him, but Victor promises that he will never see the light of day again. Victor creates more copies and Top has to rush in to rescue Fuko. He creates even more, but the other union members show off their skills while taking them out. Victor points out that they must have defeated Burn, which means they have another seat. If they let him eliminate Fuko, then they will have two open seats and he can find stronger negators to fill the roles. Yu is instantly attacks him and explains that those who lack justice and ambition can never influence the actions of others. Victor sends her flying, but this just gets her upset and she issues an order to defeat all the copies while protecting Fuko. Outside the barrier, Shen has his staff returned to him. 
Back at the fight, Yuwa's is being overwhelmed, and the other union members are just barely managing to save Fuko. They remind her that she is supposed to be focusing on bringing Andy back, so she starts calling out to him. Victor nearly shoots her directly, but Top appears out of nowhere. Top encourages her to keep talking to Andy, but he gets hit, and is amazed that Victor was able to predict where he was going. Fuko racks her brain trying to think of a way to bring Andy out, and she thinks about how they have only known each other for about one month. So much has happened, but she still doesn't know a thing about Andy. Things seem hopeless, but she can't give up. Just like on the first day they met, when Andy saved her over and over again. She refuses to quit and comes up with an idea. Fuko shoots this dude right through the scar on his forehead and jams her thumb inside. She noticed that his scar isn't on any of the copies, so she realized that that must be where Andy is being locked up. She jams her thumb deeper and demands that he give Andy back. Fuko tells Andy not to let Victor beat him and all he has to do is touch her for one second. If he does that, then she will give him the biggest stroke of unluck anyone has ever seen. Just then, the bleeding stops and Andy tells her that her idea sounds like a treat. Fuko has never been happier to see him and Andy wastes no time in giving her a kiss. Everyone watches as all the clones disappear and the tender moment lasts for a minute. Andy removes her finger from his skull and he tells her that they will pick up where they left off another time. Fuko sheepishly acts like she doesn't know what he is talking about and runs off while telling him that it would only happen in his dreams. Fuko then screams out to all the perverts that were just watching and warns them that a huge stroke of unluck is coming. Yuas commands them to get as far away as possible, but Victor has already returned, and he tells them that they won't get away. Unfortunately for Victor, Shen has used his ability on him. Shen reveals that he lied about his target needing to be within a certain distance. The truth is that he only needs to be able to see his target. Fuko's unluck arrives in the form of several meteors, and Shen hopes to see Victor again one day. Victor has a good laugh as it's been a very long time since he was defeated by humans, and the meteors come crashing down. This is by far the biggest stroke of unluck yet, which was to be expected since Andy kissed Fuko. The union members protect themselves from the shockwave, and the aftermath of the damage is insane. The town has been decimated, and a giant crater is in its place. The entire situation is unreal, and Top realizes that Fuko is nowhere to be found. She is actually making her way into the crater, but they have no clue what this little dummy is planning to do all by herself. This is incredibly dangerous as the water will soon be flooding in, but Fuko is on a mission to return Andy's card into his head. She finally makes it to him, and Victor tells her that she is one heck of a girl. Fuko jams the card back in his head and pleads for Andy to return to her. The process doesn't seem to be working, and the water comes crashing down. Sometime later, Fuko wakes up and immediately calls out to Andy. He is right there next to her, and he reveals that he ended up reading all 101 volumes of the manga she likes. Fuko has no words for him at first, but then demands to know why he did something so dangerous. He and Shen made the deal to remove the card from his head, and they didn't tell her anything. If the other members of the round table didn't show up, then Andy wouldn't be around anymore, and she would be all alone again. Andy apologizes, but she is shocked when he touches her head. Andy doesn't care and explains that when he was trapped in the darkness, all he could hear was her voice. It made him happy, so he thanks her. What's most surprising to her is that it's the first time he has actually called her by her name, but Andy just says that it's almost time for their meeting. Fuko wants him to say it again, but he just tells her to hurry up and get ready. Fuko cries, but it's out of happiness since Andy is back to normal. Fuko wonders who her new little friend is, and Andy explains that the circular robot dropped it off when they came to see her. All the little orphans came to see her too and made her a little drawing. The Union's orphanage will take care of the parentless children until they turn 18, and Andy points out that those kids have a strong will to survive. Fuko hopes that their memories of their teacher won't turn to bad memories, and Andy doubts that they will. He married that teacher and he knows that she felt so strongly about all of them. He is sure that powerful emotions reach their destination without spoiling, just like Fuko's did. In typical Andy fashion, he credits himself for his inspirational words and proclaims that it's not too bad for a guy that has been alive for 200 years. He is certain that it will make him more likable, but his speech is interrupted by the stroke of unluck from touching Fuko's head. Top welcomes the two lovebirds to the meeting and Fuko apologizes for being late. He points out that her boyfriend is burning, but Fuko is quick to point out that they aren't lovebirds. 
Everyone is pretty lighthearted, but Yuwas tells them to sit down. Andy is now ranked 9th and he explains that it's because of the clothing incident. Everyone is seated so Yuwas has Apocalypse announce the quest results. The book opens up and prepares to reveal the results of the 6 quests given to them. Elsewhere, we can hear that someone is tied up to a chair and is in really bad shape but we cannot see this person. The guy watching him reveals that the tied up guy is the negator Unseen. The guy is fascinated by Unseen since he is a self-targeting compulsory activation type. When Unseen shuts his eyes, his body and anything he recognizes as his property become invisible. The strange thing is that the blood coming from his stomach is still visible. The suit explains that he doesn't want Unseen to run off on him so he cut open his stomach and put a homing device inside his body. The suit promises that if Unseen joins his group then he will deactivate his ability. If not then Unseen's wound will not heal until the suit guy dies. The suit claims Unseen as his property and refuses to give him to the other group. Back at the round table, Fuku was shocked to learn that she had been unconscious for days. Andy isn't shocked at all though since a Shedden like Fuku isn't used to moving around so much. Apocalypse then announces their results. The first quest was the capture of UMA Burn. The participants were Yuiz, Billy, Tatiana, Ishin, Phil, and Top. They were successful and the reward is the addition of an 11th seat so one more negator may now be added to the round table. They were also successful in the second quest the capture of UMA Eat. Apocalypse pukes out a weird looking globe and reminds them that the reward for the second quest is the location of Negator Unburn. A point appears on the map and the exact location of Unburn will be shown for the next 7 days. Unburn will not know that their location has been revealed. Apocalypse states that they can catch them if they need them but it's unlikely since they already captured Burn. They also completed the quest that required the neutralization of UMA language. The reward for this is shockingly the unification of all the world's languages. We then see how great an effect these rewards can have on the entire world as all languages are unified to English. All the memories and cultures of all non-negators are altered so things can keep going smoothly. Shen contacts Mui and she answers while getting a pump. He wonders if she is wearing her necktie but she isn't as she's busy working on her gains. Shen speaks to her using their normal language without his tie on but that language no longer exists and Mui can't understand, confirming the unification of all languages. Next is the successful capture of the UMA past and the reward is the location of the artifact rebellion. Quest 5 was the capture of UMA spoil which we see was a success as he is imprisoned. Another pin is put on the planet and it's for the location of UMA unrepair. Fuku gets super hyped about this one since Unrepair might be able to give Andy the real death he desperately wants. However, she is surprised when he doesn't share her enthusiasm. Just when it seems like they could have completed all the quests, they didn't. The quest to capture the negator Unseen was failed. They expected this though since anyone that was sent to get information about Unseen ended up dying. Their bound bodies ended up in a deserted area and all of them bled to death. Because of this, Andy assumes that Unseen was taken by Unrepair. Since all quests were not completed, they will now receive a penalty. This penalty is the addition of UMA Galaxy, so the crazy book begins to puke something out. Everyone is shocked by the enormous size of the creature appearing before them but the more mature members seem bored. Once the monster stops growing, Apocalypse releases it into the air and Andy wonders if it's trying to get to the surface. Yuiz calls upon UMA Move and Fuku remembers that he was the one that brought her and Andy there. Yuiz commands Move to take them to the surface so the ground breaks. Andy takes a hold of Fuku and the two fall together. Apocalypse explains that UMA Galaxy has been added. A new rule that the world will now believe has always existed. This psychotic book laughs like a demon and wonders if the negators will be able to overcome this penalty. The union arrives on the surface which Andy assumes is Australia and Fuku is amazed to see the biggest rock in the world. Yuume Move has done his job transporting them and now expects to see quite the show. Yuiz agrees with him and promises to give him a front row seat to what she calls her justice. Move leaves and Fuku states that she thought this so called penalty would be a lot scarier. Yuiz is quick to tell her just how wrong she is. They are dealing with a Yuume that was added by Apocalypse and they always possess rules that lead to humanity's ruin. There is no exception and they prepare as the alteration is about to begin. 
Just then, the thing that came out of Apocalypse's mouth bursts in space. Some kind of core forms and a galaxy appears. Stars fill the sky and Top thinks it looks pretty amazing. Yu is wants confirmation about some type of patch and Nico is already on it. The new changes that are now common knowledge to everyone in existence are not common knowledge to the negators because their memories were not changed. Nico speaks to his team of researchers who are not negators and instructs them to give him their knowledge. It all pours into Nico's brain and he reveals that this galaxy is a cluster of celestial bodies like Earth. This penalty spawned a slew of these Earth-like bodies along with systems involving them, such as myths and days of the week. It also introduced the concept of extraterrestrial life forms called aliens, and at this very moment those aliens are invading them. Just then, a giant spaceship appears before them. They are enemies that were born moments ago from the alteration to a world that always had galaxy. That's not what they perceive, however, since to them they always existed. Born on a planet with several hundred million years of history, these aliens trained themselves to become soldiers. Then they were given ships to invade other planets. Their own planet is on a path to ruin, so they are looking for a new place to call home. A giant alien then reveals itself and introduces his race of aliens as something called X. He very bluntly explains that they are invading their planet to make it their home. Yuiz walks right up to this giant dude and introduces herself as the planet's representative. This alien is very generous and tells her that they plan to use her kind as slaves as long as they don't resist. If they do resist, however, they will all be eliminated. Yuiz fears no one, so she rejects both options and tells them to leave. This crazy alien demonstrates his immense power with a huge attack and reveals that the Axe have done their research. The human planet is horribly underdeveloped and they have yet to make any advancements into space. Humankind has no chance of winning against them in battle, so it will just be genocide. Yuiz wonders if that is really his vision of justice and he states that it is. This being the case, Yuiz removes her helmet and states that she will simply have to negate that justice. This is when we learn that her negating ability is called Unjustice. Of course the alien has no clue what that is, but he is shocked when his ships begin exploding. Things get even more unbelievable as he can only watch as his ships are firing at each other. This terrifyingly powerful alien has no clue what happened and falls to his knees in defeat. Yuiz calls out to Andy and Fuko and tells them to watch closely as this is what a penalty entails. They manage to avoid the situation this time with her ability but depending on the member involved, it could have just as easily been game over. This was the 99th penalty added and they can't afford any more. Andy wonders why, so Yuiz explains that they uncovered a stone tablet at the same time as Apocalypse. That tablet has 101 slots. Each time they receive a penalty, one slot gets filled. There is only one open slot left until it reaches 100. Beyond that lies the final penalty, the one called Ragnarok. It's a word that denotes the end, and in order to protect their planet, they must prevent that at all costs. The huge problem they have now is that Apocalypse won't open unless they have all seats filled at the round table. They have 11 seats now after passing the burn quest, so they are down one person. If they don't fill that seat, they will receive a penalty in 3 months, before they can take up any more quests. This means that their absolute most important priority right now is to secure an 11th member. The alien wonders who these crazy people are and Yuiz can't believe he is still there. Her ability should have made him take his own life, but it's clear now that his vision was all talk. This works out just fine though, as she wants him to spread a message throughout all of space. And that is to keep their hands off planet Earth. The alien is terrified and teleports out of there. We learn that this was mankind's first interaction with aliens, but it would also be the last, as all contact would cease thereafter. Yuiz reminds her team that they have learned the whereabouts of Unburn and Unrepair because of the rewards. Andy is certain that Yuiz wants to go after Unrepair first and volunteers to go. If Unrepair's ability is true to their name, Andy is certain that one attack will prove to be fatal. Yuiz accepts his decision and instructs Tatiana to go with him as backup. Fuko is assigned to the mission as well and Andy's glad that he will be able to pay everyone back for helping him out when he was trapped in Victor. Sometime later, our heroes arrive in Brazil, where they will search for unrepair. Fuko panics like a weirdo inside a mall as she is surrounded by celebrities. Andy explains that he is ready, and the nervous Fuko scolds him for leaving her alone for so long. 
She doesn't fit in there at all, and she nearly died of embarrassment. Her anger turns to shock as her boy Andy shows off a type of suit he hasn't worn in a while. Fuko thinks he looks like a celebrity, and Andy just wants to know if she likes what she sees. Fuko gets nervous, and Andy gets a little too close for comfort. We then get a look back to just a few hours ago as our heroes travel in Union's private jet. They discuss a black market auction, an auction that deals with negators, UMAs, and artifacts that the organization hasn't been able to manage. This operation was taken down at some point, but it looks like they're back in business. The guys behind it are mafia from all over the world. They always hold it in random locations, so tracking the auction down is no easy task. Yu is somehow managed to find it, and the next auction will be held tomorrow at midnight. It will be on a fancy yacht docked at the port of Rio de Janeiro. Unrepair will likely be there, but they don't know if he will be buying or selling. The plan is for them to infiltrate the ship as guests using some passes that Nico made them. Only a select few celebrities are allowed aboard, so they have to disguise themselves. Back to the present, Fugo gets really uncomfortable when trying on far too revealing clothing. She is used to covering herself up, and she blames Andy for picking out skimpy outfits for her to try. Andy has a legitimate reason, as he explains that they need a lot of surface area to make sure big strokes of unluck occur. Fuko thinks he is just being selfish, as that could cause innocent people to get injured. Andy confidently explains that the night will end with her being his girl, and he's not letting anyone else lay their hands on her. Andy explains that the people on this ship buy people with money, so they aren't really innocent bystanders. Andy hands her some more outfits to try, but she quickly notices that he once again snuck in some skimpy stuff. Another look back shows Fuko asking Yu Wiz why she chose to assign her to the mission. Andy and Tatiana are both really strong, but Fuko fears that she will just drag them down. Yu Wiz explains that she is simply acting in accordance with her own vision of justice. Her justice is to protect their planet and the innocent people who inhabit it. It's the same reason she ordered Shen and Void to eliminate Andy and Fuko a while back. They were just too dangerous. However, their recent fight against Victor has made her realize something. If they can somehow manage to control Fuko's unluck ability, then it might just be powerful enough to kill God. Fuko clearly isn't ready now though, and Ragnarok is drawing near as well. Yuas then shocks Fuko with her next request. She wants Fuko to continue to work closely with Andy and fall in love with him. Back to the present, Fuko gets tired of trying on dresses. Andy likes the last one though, and helps her fix her posture. Andy thinks it's a 10 out of 10, so they go with it. At a hotel, Fuko gets really nervous around all the people, so Andy suggests that they go for a walk. On this little walk, our boy Andy boldly brings up the unluck that they brought when they were fighting Victor. It was when they kissed, so Andy wants to get some of that sweet unluck for himself. Fuko takes off running, but Andy just wants a meteor shower of his own. Andy is jealous because he was the one that kissed her, but Victor was the one that got the stroke of unluck. Fuko declares that she only gives out big strokes of unluck out of necessity, so she plans to use a small one to get him off her back. Andy tries to kiss her instead, but Fuko refuses. She takes off her gloves and tells Clothie to expose Andy's chest. Clothie does just that, so Fuko touches skin to skin with Andy. Clothie just now realizes that the unluck is going to hurt him too, but it's too late as Truck Coon comes barreling in to hit Andy. Fuko apologizes to Clothie, but promises to give him his favorite food later, a ball of yarn. Andy then becomes shark food, so Fuko realizes that it was a combo style stroke of unluck. Low potency strokes of singular unluck occurring in a chain reaction. Things get a bit serious as Andy explains that he doesn't really know who Victor is. He doesn't even know himself for that matter. Victor mentions something about being the original, so Andy thinks that might be true, especially since he doesn't have any memories of his childhood. Andy warns Fuko that Victor could appear again one day, and prepares to ask her for a favor. Fuko interrupts him though, and simply states that if that happens, then she will use her unluck to save Andy as many times as he needs. They prepare to go get ready for the auction, but Fuko realizes that they just touched again. This stroke of unluck causes Tatiana to crash down on her boy, and she goes over the plan. The two of them will be going undercover, while Tatiana infiltrates from somewhere else. They will search for unrepair from the inside, and she will cover the outside. Tatiana gives Fuko a bow for her dress that will replace the tie that Union members wear. 
Tatiana then embarrasses Fuko when she reminds them that they're going to be disguised as a married couple, and she tells them to do their best. That night, the two arrive at the ship, and Andy tells his darling wife to get ready. After they board the ship, it sets off, and Andy reminds Fuko to stay focused. They are about to enter society's underbelly, so he doesn't want her to think about righting the wrongs they will surely see around them. Fuko overhears some rich dude talking about something called cryptids, and he explains that they are likely talking about UMAs. Fuko is horrified when the rich dude talks about cooking the UMA, and Andy reminds her to stop listening to the grotesque conversation. They overhear some other conversation about a rumor that says a negator will be the main item for this auction. However, negators are supposedly easier to find now more than ever. Andy blames that on the fact that all languages have been unified thanks to the quest. Languages being unified is only the case for normal people though, not negators. He reminds Fuko that she can only understand Shen because of the necktie they wear. Every normal person in the world speaks English now, so the negators who don't speak English stick out like sore thumbs. Negators being easier to find isn't a terrible thing though, since it means they will be easier to find for the union as well. Fuko then wonders if it's better for negators to join the union or to be auctioned off. And he thinks it's the same either way, since they will either die in a quest or become some rich person's plaything. Fuko wonders about the negator being auctioned off and thinks about how she might be able to relate to them not knowing the logic behind their abilities, and not knowing what they should or shouldn't do. And he explains that he used to think that negators had only three paths to take in life. They could accept their ability and lead their life. They could fall into despair and choose death. Or they could double down and embrace a life of crime. He realizes now, however, that there is a fourth option, and that's killing the source, God. After meeting the others, he realized that they don't have to accept, give up, or double down on anything, they can fight. Elsewhere on the ship, we see that Unrepair is being told that a certain area is off limits. He tries to convince the guards to let him through with his girlfriend, but only ends up getting a gun to his face instead. The Mafia guard explains that it will be his last warning, but Unrepair asks the girl named Latla if he will die. Latla can apparently see what will happen, and explains that Unrepair will get shot in the head. Unrepair decides that that won't be happening, and travels at an insane speed. The Mafia guys take severe damage, and they can't understand how this guy managed to cut them so accurately in such a short amount of time. They can't even move their hands and realize that they were cut with surgical precision. Unrepair whistles for his pet named Kane to come to him, and we shockingly find that Kane is a huge monster. Kane tosses two blobs onto the ship, and Unrepair tells Latla that she should have come aboard the same way. She gets really upset though, as she didn't want to get covered in bile. Unrepair tells Latla that he won't be needing his suit jacket anymore because they're going to be running wild soon. The big guy named Rip wonders if what they were looking for is really on the ship, and Unrepair confirms that there is one. Rip has a good laugh since Latla's fortune telling was wrong, but she says that it was just this one time. Unrepair tries to welcome the little guy named Fang, but Fang only speaks Chinese. Unrepair speaks Chinese to thank him for coming, but Fang retorts that it's not necessary. Latla tosses the suit off the ship, but we see that Tatiana overheard everything. She then informs the others. She states that there were four of them, and at least two of them are negators. They seem to be after the negator being put up for auction. Yuiz hears this as well, and determines that they are negator hunters. This group has come up quite a bit as of late, and they are likely the ones that took the negator unseen. This group shares common ground with the Union, as they both specialize in collecting negators by force. There is a big difference between them though. The Union seeks to kill God in order to be freed of the rules. The Hunters on the other hand seek revenge against the world. If the negators they collect prove worthless, then they dispose of them. Yuiz realizes though that they actually share that last part in common. Fuko says that she rejects that idea. The reason they try to take her life was to protect others. Fuko then gets herself prepared and takes off her shoes. She acknowledges that the powers of a negator can be painful and sad to deal with. However, that doesn't make it okay to take it out on the world. Andy gets hyped up by his fake wife's speech, and the two prepare for battle. Fuko gets rid of her wig and grabs onto Andy to charge up her unluck onto him. They make their way past some guards, and Andy instructs Tatiana to bring him his unbreakable sword. One of the guards sends out an alert that intruders might be heading for the items on auction, so they open fire on our heroes. 
Tatiana arrives just in time with Andy's sword, and he shockingly uses it to take off his own head. Fuko reminds everyone that negators aren't just objects to be auctioned off, and tosses Andy's head that is now loaded with unluck. The stroke of unluck causes a massive explosion, and our heroes prepare to retrieve the negator that is going to be auctioned. They make their way down several stairs, as that is where the cargo hold is. Andy points out that the negator hunters are definitely headed there as well, so they have to hurry. They might have to fight them, so he tells Fuko to be ready. A look back to just a moment ago, we see that Fuko's stroke of unluck came in the form of exploding dynamite. We see that the negator being auctioned off is a kid, and he used this opportunity to try and escape. A guard tries to stop him, but this kid uses his strange ability to completely stop the guard from moving. The kid then tries to run, but the guard starts to move again, so the kid has to stop and use his ability again. The guard freezes again, but the kid isn't quite the predicament. If the kid moves, then he can't stop the guard, but if he stops the guard, then he can't run away. This kid always knew he had a power, but he always kept it a secret, and he has no idea how to use it in such a high-stress situation. A look back to before he was captured, we learn that this kid's name is Chikara. Being a negator but not knowing about the language merging, Chikara couldn't understand why everyone suddenly started speaking English. Even everything on television changed to English, so Chikara accused everyone of playing a prank on him. His close friend had no clue what he was talking about and wondered why Chikara was talking in a weird way. This was the exact moment he was tased into unconsciousness and captured. The next thing Chikara knew, he was caged up and now has this Yakuza looking guy pointing a gun at him. On top of that, he is surrounded by terrifying creatures and he can't get his legs to stop shaking from fear. Chikara's power stops working for some reason and the guard is able to move again. Chikara is far too valuable to let get away, so the guard decides that he will have to shoot him in the leg to make him stay still. Unfortunately for this guy, the hunters arrive to incapacitate him, and Unrepair realizes that Chikara is an external targeting compulsory type. As long as he doesn't move, Chikara negates the movement of a target in his field of vision. Unrepair is very intrigued, as Chikara's power is the restrainer type he has been hoping to find. He values this kid a lot now, and refuses to ever let the Union get their hands on him. Unfortunately, Chikara speaks Japanese, but they don't speak it. They can't communicate, which upsets Unrepair, since he wanted to learn more about his power. Creed is a genius though, and says that he will take care of it. He takes out his Gatling gun, and tells Chikara that he's going to shoot him, so he better use his ability if he doesn't want to die. Latla wonders if this is a bad way to recruit people, but Unrepair allows it. If Chikara can't intentionally use his power, then he is useless to them anyway. On top of that, if Chikara dies, then the ability will just transfer over to a different person. Chikara panics as he just now realizes that these people aren't actually there to save him, and he wonders if he should just use his power to stop the giant guy. Creed starts counting down from 5, but Chikara can't stop shaking. Chikara hates having this power, since if he didn't have it, then he would still be with his family. Creed's countdown reaches zero, but Chikara decides against using his power, and apologizes to his mom and dad as he prepares to die. Creed unloads a ton of bullets into the kid, and they all determine that he must be dead. However, they are all shocked when they realize that Andy has blocked all the shots with his body. Fuko arrives as well, and she gives Chikara the tie that Union members wear that allow them to comprehend any language. Andy tells Tatiana where they are, and has her come to them immediately. Andy notices that the big guy is using a Gatling gun, but there are no ammo clips in sight, and he wonders how he can even fire the thing. The covered up guy is clearly a martial artist, and Andy can tell that he is really strong. The girl is a support type with limited equipment, so she might have some kind of counter ability. Before Andy can even analyze the eye patch guy, his neck is getting sliced by him. Unrepair can tell that his new opponent is somehow able to repair himself, and wonders what kind of negator Andy is. He ultimately decides that it doesn't matter though, as he reveals that the wound he gave Andy won't repair itself until he dies. Andy tries to cut off his own head so it can heal, but Unrepair reveals that it won't work. This is because Unrepair negates any and all healing techniques applied to the wounds he inflicts. Unrepair thinks it's game over, but Andy calls Fuko's attention to something and she seems to understand. Unrepair states that they were the ones that found Chikara first, so they should hand him over. They plan to end the kid's life, since they want to transfer his ability over to someone who is not a coward like him. 
Unrepair also realized that the Union were responsible for merging languages, and he thanks them for making it easier to hunt negators. Andy has had enough of this guy and charges at him. Andy thanks him for making it crystal clear that he won't be the next Union member, and Foucault shockingly uses Andy's sword to chop his head off. Andy uses his rocket head to knock Unrepair back, and Unrepair wonders who these two people are. Just then, Tatiana finally arrives and tells her teammates that she will handle both Creed and Rip. That leaves the other two with Andy and Fuko, so Andy instantly jams his sword into his fist. Unrepair can't believe how insane Andy looks, as what he is doing seems really painful. Andy tries to attack this guy, but is shocked at how he is able to dodge his attacks. Unrepair's counter slices off his hands, and Shikara can't believe all the crazy stuff that is happening. Andy prepares to chop off his arms to heal his hands, but Unrepair once again reminds him that all healing techniques will not work. Andy does it anyway and shocks everyone when he's able to do it. Andy instantly launches his forearms at Unrepair, but is stunned when they are forced to change direction. He assumes that it had to have been the girl's ability, and Unrepair explains that he finds Andy very amusing as he was able to hit him. Unrepair wants Andy to join their team and explains that they are a lot more fun. While Lala fixes his nose, Unrepair realizes why Andy's technique worked. Andy acted like he was using a healing technique, but it was actually an offensive attack. He chopped off his arms to use his arm rocket attack, so Unrepair's rule didn't apply. Unrepair really likes Andy's style, but Andy refuses to join them. Andy was really interested in Unrepair at first, but realizes now that his ability won't be enough to kill him, and has completely lost interest. It's a shame, but Unrepair turns to Fuko and wonders if she would like to join them instead. He liked how she was crazy enough to chop off Andy's head and points out that Chikara is too much of a wimp to do anything like that. Chikara is so terrified that his constant shaking doesn't even allow him to fulfill the requirement of remaining still to use his ability. The ability Chikara has is amazing, but Unrepair thinks that the person it's attached to is a dud. For this reason, they want to end Chikara's life. Their group's goal is to recruit all the strongest negators. Once they have enough members, they will start taking over nations. Fuko thinks they should blame God, who is the one toying with them, instead of innocent people. However, Unrepair explains that they are not obligated to risk themselves for that. And he doesn't want to do any talking, so he just attacks, but he fails. He can't understand why his katana missed, but the blood somehow still hit the girl, and he wonders if she negated the attack. Being practically untouchable, Unrepair decides that it's just time to end Chikara's life. He hopes that the person that gets his ability is worth it, and launches a blade right at him. Andy quickly intercepts the blade, but realizes that he can't stop its momentum with his regeneration because of Unrepair's ability. Just before the blade strikes Chikara, Fuko jumps in to take the hit. Unrepair thinks that was pretty dumb, pointing out that her wound won't heal, and he predicts that she only has an hour left to live. Unrepair calls her useless garbage now, but this enrages Andy. Andy prepares to remove the card from his head, but Fuko knows how dangerous that is and stops him. She explains that Andy's arm was able to slow the blade down, so it didn't pierce her too deeply. Fuko tells him to stay himself, so Andy listens to her. He holds on to her and vows to eliminate Unrepair. Just then, several guards arrive, so Unrepair decides that it's time for them to leave. The guards see what's happening, but they assume that Andy is one of the hunters that have been messing with their operation. Andy realizes that he will be fine if they shoot at him while they get away, but Fuko will get hurt. However, if he doesn't move now, then Unrepair will get too far away. Just then, Chikara covers her up and is shocked when they tell him to be careful not to touch Fuko with his bare skin. He is surprised to hear about her negator abilities and promises to be careful. This coward of a kid then shockingly tells the guards that the girl needs medical attention right away. Even though he is clearly terrified, he reminds the guards that they are after him and begs them to help the girl. They fire at Chikara as they refuse to listen, and Chikara once again thinks about his mom and dad while holding his bracelet. A look into his past shows that his mother was in really bad shape at a hospital. She told him that he would meet a lot of people throughout his life. If any of them ever showed him kindness, then he should cherish those people. If they are in trouble, then he should take action and help them. She was certain that if he did that, then those people would become irreplaceable to him. The guards have run out of patience and decide to just shoot everyone. Chikara remembers his mother's words once more as the bullets approach, and he shockingly finds the power in himself to stop everything. 
Andy can't believe what just happened, and we learn that this kid's ability is unmove. Chikara has no idea what has gone on this entire time, but he is sure of one thing. That girl was hurt because of him being a coward. He promises not to freak out anymore, and just knows that if he uses his ability to stop the guards, then Andy will be able to save Fuko. Andy gets hyped by this kid's determination, and calls him and his ability really sick. We then get a look at Tatiana's fight against Creed and the assassin looking dude. Creed keeps shooting at her non-stop, but he can't believe that his 20mm rounds aren't even making a dent. He compliments her armored suit and tosses a grenade at her. It doesn't affect her at all, and Feng must step in to keep Creed from getting squashed. Creed tosses more grenades, but Tatiana realizes that the grenades seem to be coming out of thin air. She doesn't have time to think about what kind of ability he has though, as Feng quickly sends her flying. Tatiana is stunned since he was able to crack the black metal armor that Nico created, and determines that they must have some crazy powerful negating abilities. Just then, Andy calls her. She calls Andy zombie, and he reveals to her that Fuku is severely injured. A wound inflicted by unrepair won't heal itself until he dies, so they only have a few hours at most. They have no other choice but to kill Unrepair before then. Tatiana becomes visibly upset, so Creed mocks her for losing one of her friends. We then get a look back to when Tatiana destroyed Andy because she was furious that they killed Gina. The fight was stopped by their leader, but Tatiana wasn't finished, and she told the zombie to meet her out back for a good old fashioned beatdown. They head to Nico's combat test site, where the other union members excitedly gather around to watch the fight and Andy tells Fuko to stay back. Tatiana explains that while the others have accepted them, she still doesn't recognize them as a member. She vows to get revenge for Gina and begins her assault. Andy skillfully dodges all her attacks, and Tatiana points out how Andy was clueless about Gina's feelings. He was oblivious to the feelings she carried with her for the 40 years he was gone, and when they met again, he trampled all over them. Andy is cold-blooded as always, as he reveals that he knew. He knew Gina was in love with him, but he killed her anyway. Andy doesn't run away from that fact, but it infuriates Tatiana, and she refuses to forgive him. She continues her assault, but Andy can tell that she is getting dangerously close to hitting Fuko. One punch is definitely about to hit her, but Tatiana is shocked when she sees that Andy rescued her. Tatiana can't believe that he protected her, but realizes that if he didn't, then she would have ended up killing Fuko. Nico tells her to calm down and explains that the next quest will reveal if they are worthy of being in the organization. To drive his point home even further, he states that Gina wouldn't want them fighting each other either. Nico's efforts to calm things down are wasted as Andy just sees it as the perfect opportunity to land a counterattack. Everyone is stunned and Andy is knocked back by Tatiana's scream from having to be touched by him. Just then, a warning is announced from Tatiana's suit. It states that the obligatory release of UT area will commence in 3 minutes. Nico frantically tells Andy to get Fuko out of there because if he doesn't then she will surely die. He reveals that Tatiana's armor is not meant to protect her body, it is meant to restrain her terrifying ability. Once released, it's capable of wiping out an entire town. Nico sends out an emergency announcement to the entire organization. In it, he initiates the emergency relocation of UMA and artifact storage to level 4. Those things are instantly moved and Nico tells anyone that are on floors 5 and below to get to a higher level immediately. Top carries the Stradlers just hanging around and Billy shows concern for Tatiana. Power is surging from Tatiana's body and she is terrified out of her mind. Just then, Fuko shockingly rushes to her and tells her that everything is okay. She apologizes for her having to see parts of Andy she didn't want to see, but tells her to calm down. Tatiana wonders why they haven't run for their lives yet, and reminds them that she has lost control. She tries to peel Fuku off of her, but Fuku refuses to let go. She continues trying, but Fuku finally comes clean and reveals that it was her. She was the one that ended Gina's life. Andy was fighting to protect her, but her unluck is what killed Gina. She apologizes, but promises to do her best in the Union to make up for what she did. Fuko wants to learn more about her, and hopes that they can become friends. Just then, everyone is shocked as the countdown stops. Soon after that, we see that Fuko is making an attempt to be friendly with Tatiana. Tatiana is still upset, so she tells Fuko to never touch her plushies, but Fuko says that she would never even try. It's clear that they mean a lot to Tatiana, so Fuko just gets to the point. 
she would like for them to shake hands and patch things up. Tatiana is quick to point out that she can't actually shake hands since she must stay inside the suit, but that's completely fine with Fuko. She wants to shake the robot hand. Fuko shows her immense optimism as she hopes that someday, when they are free of their negator powers and they have normal bodies, they will be able to actually hold hands. Fuko's kind words manage to reach Tatiana through her cold round metal prison. Tatiana agrees with Fuko and they shake hands. We see that the guys are watching outside and Billy thanks Andy, but Andy points out that he didn't do jack squat. Back to the present, Fuko is ready for them to run away. Chikara, who just showed a ton of bravery, just now realizes that if he releases his power, he will surely die. He apologizes for being useless as always, but it's not a problem since Andy quickly gets them all out of the way of the bullets. Tatiana is still getting a face full of bullets, and Andy points out to her that their number one priority is eliminating unrepair. Andy won't be able to back Tatiana up, but this little girl is crazy and tells him that his help isn't needed anyway. Tatiana has gotten very serious and tells Andy to hurry up and get to the top deck. Andy wonders why, but she just tells him to go. Tatiana thinks about how despite her horrible body, Fuko still treated her normally, without laughing or pitying her. Fuko is the first female friend she has ever made, so she refuses to forgive the people that hurt someone so special to her. Tatiana then announces the voluntary release of UT Area, and she begins to glow. Elsewhere, Latla can't believe that they are leaving empty-handed. Unrepair reveals that he actually swiped some stuff and proudly explains that he will divide it all up for everyone later. Latla wonders what they will do about Creed and Fang, but Unrepair has no answer. We then watch as the meathead Creed does the only thing he knows how to do, and that is fire his giant gun. He can tell that a few bullets are getting through and proclaims victory. Fang shows that the bullets were actually stopped and Creed realizes that she must have another barrier inside the suit. Creed hates resorting to sneaky attacks, but he has no choice and puts a mask on. He tosses poison gas at Tatiana and explains that it eliminates anyone who inhales it in three minutes. We then learn a bit about Tatiana's ability. She is a self-targeting compulsory activation type of negator. She was born to a normal family, but her life took a turn on her fifth birthday. She was a happy little kid, but that was the day the ability transferred to her. Her parents were crushed to death, and the remains of their home were scattered everywhere. Tatiana was dazed and confused, so she ran from the cops, but the mafia eventually captured her. She was auctioned off soon after as a negator with the ability to negate the touch of any and all things. She didn't have a fancy suit back then, so she was fed through a special tube. The auctioneer explained that since she repels all impurities, she would be the perfect decorative ornamental piece. The bidding began, but it was quickly interrupted by a barrage of bullets. It was a massacre done by one man. It was Billy and he was so disgusted by the auction that he was almost glad to be blind. Billy tried to speak with the girl, but Tatiana just insisted that he end her life. The little psycho wanted him to put his gun in her mouth to unalive her, and she explained that nothing good comes from living in her body. She can't dress up, she can't hold a plushie, and she can't even eat her favorite cake. Worst of all, she wants to die so she can hurry up and apologize to her parents. It becomes pretty clear that she is still just a kid though, as she refers to her parents as mommy and daddy. Billy decides to do as she wishes and tells her to open her mouth. Tatiana prepares for the end of her life, but she is stunned when Billy just gives her a cake bar. Billy knows all about her negator ability and explains that it produces an untouchable barrier from the surface of her hair and her skin. However, opening her mouth creates a hole in the barrier. He knew this because of the report he received, so he made the snacks ahead of time. Tatiana absolutely loves them and calmly asks him what other flavors he has. Some time after that, Nico made her her suit. It is what contains and compresses her barrier, which grew bigger each year. Tatiana became able to control the robot arms with her brainwaves, just as she would actual limbs. Nico warned her that she is suppressing a lot of force, and unleashing it will cause a huge recoil. It could become a weapon or a massive disaster. Tatiana was confused by him calling it a weapon, so Billy explained that her power doesn't just cause people harm at random. He told her that there will be a time when she wants to protect someone dear to her, so he encouraged her to let her power loose. Back to the present, we see that that time has come. Andy arrives at the top deck, so Tatiana proclaims that she would rather destroy everything than let Unrepair get away. 
She doesn't want to just destroy Unrepair, she wants to make sure none of the others touch Fuko either. Tatiana's ability is called Untouchable, and she unleashes her barrier. This thing is incredibly dangerous, as it instantly disintegrates Creed's arm the second it touches it. The barrier even destroys the ship, and Tatiana tells Andy to look for Unrepair. They are actually right next to each other, so Andy credits Tatiana for making it possible. It's Andy's turn now, so he shoots his finger bullet right at the one-eyed Unrepair. Andy's finger bullet changes direction just like it did before, and his other shots don't land either. Andy continues to chase Unrepair, but he has some sort of rocket boots that allow him to move around in the sky. Andy already knows they have already planned a way to escape, and if they get away, Fuko dies. That is why they must settle the fight right now, and Andy tells Chikara that he will be counting on him. Chikara is determined to make his parents proud, and Latla wonders why they just won't give up. Chikara uses his amazing unmove ability and seemingly freezes everyone. Unrepair thinks about how this just puts them at a stalemate since neither party can move. Andy is surprisingly able to fire his finger bullet, but the bullet gets frozen as it gets close to Unrepair. Unrepair wonders if Andy just missed, but he realizes that Andy is far too skilled to just miss such a crucial shot. Unrepair determines that he must be planning something, but points out that Andy's attack proves something else. It proves why Andy is still able to move parts of his body, despite everyone being frozen in midair. Chikara's ability must only negate the movement of just the part he can see. Only the upper right part of Andy's body is in Chikara's field of vision, so he can still move the rest of his body. Unrepair and Latla are right at the center though, and so is Andy's finger bullet. Andy has Chikara deactivate his ability, catching Unrepair by surprise. Andy's finger bullet manages to hit Latla, but it causes minimal damage, and Unrepair realizes that Andy put a spin on it to make a curve. Andy instructs Shakara to turn his ability back on, but Unrepair has surprisingly already moved above them. Unrepair uses his boots to unleash a move called Artifact Blade Runner, but Shakara is shaking from fear and can't use his ability to stop it. Andy has his two friends move their legs out of the way, and he is sliced in half. Andy can't believe that Unrepair had an artifact under his sleeve this entire time, and Chikara apologizes for failing him. Unrepair points to Chikara's cowardly nature for being the reason his ability is so inconsistent, and fires a ton more blades at them. Andy is impressed that Chikara was able to stop the blades, but Chikara explains that he was only able to stop them because he is literally scared stiff. Running out of time, Andy tells Fuko to listen carefully, as they will have to avoid Latla's negator ability to defeat Unrepair. Unrepair and Latla are able to speak to each other because Unrepair covered their mouths from Chikara's sight. Andy explains that while he hasn't figured out Latla's power completely, it's clear that feints and sneak attacks like the curved bullet he shot managed to slip under her radar. Andy plans to gamble everything on Fuko's unluck ability, but they just need to get closer to Unrepair. Luckily, Tatiana is there as well, so she uses her barrier to destroy the blades and launch them right at their opponent. Some of Andy's blood squirts right on Chikara's eyes, allowing Unrepair to move again, and the two enemies fire crescent attacks at each other. They cancel each other out, and Andy realizes that he can't get enough power from just the waist up. Fuko gives Andy a kiss on the cheek, so he warns Chikara that a meteorite will be falling on top of him soon. Andy plans to get Unrepair caught in it, but it probably won't hit them because of Latla's ability. That is why he needs Chikara. Just then, Unrepair's attack slices Andy up and separates everyone. The last part of Andy manages to reach Unrepair, but he cannot heal because they are wounds caused by Unrepair. Chikara fears that he will ruin their plan, but Andy tells all his friends that they are the type to put their lives on the line in order to help others. And those are the types of people that always come through. Andy puts himself in the way of the falling meteorite, and Unrepair is amazed to see that this was part of their plan. He determines that this must be Fuko's ability, but he isn't concerned since as long as he has Latla, nothing will ever hit its mark. He is correct as the meteorite changes direction at the last moment and crashes into the ocean. Tatiana moves the others with her barrier to find Andy, and they spot him in the distance. Unrepair can tell that they are planning something, but he explains that it's useless. He has given Andy an unrepairable wound. He also told him the conditions for deactivating it, which is to kill him. This means that the very act of trying to kill Unrepair becomes another healing technique. All healing techniques are negated by Unrepair's ability, so Andy won't be able to kill him. Unrepair assumes that Andy is trying to overcome Latla's ability to get a clear shot at him, but he is certain that his plan will fail. The more they desire to live, the more he negates them. 
Unrepair prepares to eliminate Andy's friends, but Chikara thinks back to Andy's plan. Andy told Chikara to find him after the meteorite and freeze Unrepair for just a moment. Thanks to Fuko's encouragement, Chikara freezes Unrepair mid-attack and reveals that he froze him right between himself and Andy. That way, Andy's body is hidden behind Unrepair's body. This means Andy isn't frozen by Chikara, so he launches a Crimson Finger bullet. Fuko moves Chikara out of the way at the very last moment, and Unrepair's heart is pierced by Andy's shot. Only now does Unrepair realize that people like them really do exist, but there is no time to think. Latla quickly calls on their pet whale. It catches them and she asks for Feng and Creed to come help her. As they leave, Fuko demands to know who they are and what they are trying to accomplish, but Latla surprisingly tells Fuko that she should save those questions for Unrepair. She declares that Unrepair will definitely not be dying and Fuko is left to wonder what she meant by that. After they get away, Tatiana freaks out about Fuko's unrepairable injury, but Andy tells her not to worry. Firing his crimson bullet has slowed down Andy's regeneration, but he is gradually healing. This means that unrepair's ability has definitely been deactivated. A look back at what exactly happened reveals that the meteorite sent Andy bouncing off the ocean surface and into the sky. This sent him really far away from unrepair, approximately 100 meters away. By distancing himself from his target and sniping from out of sight, Andy hoped to break through Latla's defenses. This would only allow for one shot though, since if he missed and drew her attention, he wouldn't get a second attempt. On top of that, from this distance, a normal finger bullet would have lost speed before reaching its target, and it wouldn't be able to deliver a killing blow. That is why Andy had to focus all regeneration he had lost into his fingertip to fire a super pressurized finger bullet. This extreme measure impairs his regeneration a great deal for several minutes, leaving him exposed. In the past, Andy always planned to protect everyone on his own, so he could never use this attack. However, this time he realized he wasn't alone. Chikara froze Unrepair, ensuring the shot wouldn't miss, and Andy was able to defeat Unrepair. This was the moment that Unrepair realized what type of people they were. They all worked in the interest of saving each other's lives, not their own, and that is why they were able to beat him despite his negator ability. Andy apologizes for not being able to protect Fuko properly and commends her on her unluck ability. Andy compliments Tatiana for her contributions in the fight as well. Tatiana acts disinterested though and points out that she was just making things right for punching him that one time. Andy commends Chikara as well since this kid was thrown into a crazy situation but he pulled through regardless. Andy explains that Unrepair couldn't have been defeated without everyone's teamwork and they all celebrate. Fuko would like for Chikara to come with them to Union because things could get pretty dangerous for him. Chikara is hesitant and Fuko doesn't want to pressure him so she asks the others if they could keep Chikara a secret for a while. Andy doesn't mind and Tatiana begrudgingly agrees but only because they are friends. Yuiz would definitely force Chikara to become a member if she found out so they give Chikara one week to decide if he wants to join or not. A Union plane arrives to take them home and Chikara thinks about the words his mother told him on her deathbed. The words that told him that if he ever encountered people that showed him kindness, then he should cherish those people. One week later, Chikara is enjoying normal life back at school. Andy and Fuko wait to see if he will come with them, but they have no clue what the kid will decide. They gave him a necktie translator, so as long as he can hide his ability, he can just be a regular kid. They gave him until 5 o'clock to show up, so they will leave if he doesn't arrive in 10 minutes. Andy determines that if Chikara's resolve isn't strong enough, then he's better off not joining anyway, since he will just end up dead. Fuko agrees and points out that everyone only has one life to live. If a person ends up dying, there is no coming back. You would think this is a pretty obvious statement, but the two are then shocked by someone who has come to greet them. Some little dude arrives to tell her that she is wrong. Fuko is stunned to see a miniature Unrepair, and she wonders how he survived. Fuko wonders if Unrepair didn't actually die, but the one-eyed little boy explains that he did indeed die, as he was shot right through his heart. He concedes to losing fair and square, and because of that he now looks like this. Unrepair doesn't explain how though, and just reveals that he will be back to normal soon. Fuko wonders what he is doing there, and assumes that the kid wants a rematch. Unrepair says that isn't it at all, but Andy sends him flying with a punch before he can explain. Unrepair is pretty injured from the hit, but is glad to see that he has lost his first baby tooth. Andy is actually relieved to see Unrepair again, as he wasn't satisfied with just putting a hole in his heart. Unrepair realizes that Andy is upset about him hurting Fuko, but he remembers that Fuko was actually the one that jumped in front of his knife. 
He checks up on Fuko and she reveals that her wound healed because a certain doctor helped her. Unrepair apologizes and uses that as proof that he is there to make things better. He reveals that he is there to give them a gift and Fuko shocked to see that it's a handgun. Her shock makes Unrepair realize that she has never dealt with an artifact before so he tosses her the gun. When Fuko catches it she has some crazy psychedelic visions. Her mind can't handle what she is seeing and she drops the gun. Andy rushes to her side and she asks him what happened. Andy is next to touch the gun but he explains that he has handled artifacts before and this one is different. Unrepair explains that different artifacts show different things and this gun is special. The image it produces is pretty rare. Fuko wonders what the giant black figure was that she saw and Unrepair reveals that it's the god they are setting out to eliminate. Unrepair then reveals the plans of his organization. They believe that the god cannot be defeated so they plan to rule the world until god destroys it. Andy points out that they are just wasting their time since the world will end soon after they take it all over but Unrepair shocks him. Unrepair reveals that unlike them he's able to go to the next step. Just then, before Unrepair can explain further, Yuwa's calls on all off-mission members of the Union. She informs them that some roundtable members are currently battling the Gator Hunters in Egypt and China and they need anyone in the vicinity to provide backup. We then see Top in China and Nexilla in Egypt and they are both up against the Gator Hunters. Unrepair points out that the world is only able to function because they live upon it as vessels. It doesn't make sense that they are the only ones that fight and suffer. Unrepair thinks it should be the other way around and things are unfair the way they are now. He reveals that his group is called the Unders and in 3 months the world will flip around and become fair. Unrepair creates some distance between them and wonders what they thought about the vision they saw. He reiterates that God will be impossible to defeat and promises to put in a good word for them if they join Under. Andy is positive as always while calling this kid an idiot and explains that the vision just confirmed that God is real. Since it's real that means they can kill it. Unrepair is extremely amused by Andy's answer and wishes them luck. After he leaves Andy and Fuku are glad to see that Chikara is ready to team up with them. However this is the first Chikara has heard of them wanting to fight God so he quickly changes his mind and runs away from our crazy heroes. They of course chase after him so Chikara resorts to using his ability. Andy doesn't get caught in it though since he is well aware of what Chikara is capable of. He tells the kid that they need to have a talk and Chikara just hopes Andy doesn't end his life. Fuko is able to move again but she acts like a weirdo as she looks at the school in amazement. Andy realizes how excited she is so he has Chikara confirm that there aren't any students left inside. Andy tells Fuko to put her blazer on as he doesn't want anyone to find out that they are strangers. He of course thinks about doing something nice for Fuko so he tells her that they will be going inside the school and he lies by telling her that Chikara forgot something inside. Inside Chikara reveals that he will be preparing for college soon and Fuko is just hyped about the entire experience. She is even amazed to see a real life classroom. She sits at a desk and points out that this is usually where a protagonist sits while they look outside and get lost in thought. Fuko quickly calms herself though as it's time for serious talk. Andy reveals that if the quest proceed as normal and they keep up their losing streak the world will end in April. If the next penalty they get hit with is the world ender though then it will be January. Chikara then reveals that there are two things he must do at all cost. One is to live and the other is to atone. Chikara explains that he has a really bleak story to tell and our two heroes are all ears. Chikara starts his story off with a shocker as he reveals that he killed his parents. It happened when he was a first year in middle school. Chikara was walking with his parents and he went ahead of them to cross the street. It was their turn to cross but Chikara was shocked since when he turned to look at his parents he saw that they weren't moving. He didn't realize it at the time but this was when Chikara received his negator ability and it was his fault that his mom and dad couldn't move. That was when the devious truck coon decided to pounce and land a two for one attack. Chikara ran to them allowing them to move again but it was far too late and truck coon had already won. Fuku was reminded of how she caused her parents death and she sobs while hearing Chikara's story. He explains that his father died instantly and his mother suffered serious injuries. She fought to stay alive but passed a week later. A while later he realized that his ability caused the incident. He thought about ending his own life many times but he just kept seeing his parents faces. 
This would make Chikara wonder what they would want him to do, and the answer was always the same. They would want him to live. Chikara decided that he didn't need to impress anybody. He figured that as long as he kept on living, then in some small way, it could help make him a better son. Chikara always thought that this was his only reason for living, but then he was caught by the mafia and caged up. Then, just as his life was about to end, he met Fuko and Andy. Not only did they save the little nerd, they also taught him that his ability can help others. Chikara was always searching for a way, outside of just living, to make amends. He has found a way now, and that is by helping others. Chikara promises not to run away anymore, and asks them to let him join their team. Just then, Chikara's friend arrives to walk home with him, and he wonders who the old guy is that looks like he got held back 10 grades. Fuko has a good chuckle when she hears this, but Chikara's friend named Ryo notices that she isn't wearing their school blazer. Fuko can't stop laughing, so Andy decides to just tickle her into unconsciousness. The entire situation is pretty strange, but Ryo quickly forgets about it and remembers that he has big news. He tells Chikara that he will be heading to some big time university on a basketball scholarship, and Chikara couldn't be happier for his buddy. They celebrate, but Andy notices that their car has arrived and tells Chikara that it's time to go. Ryo goes back to wondering what's going on, but Chikara freezes him and says goodbye to his good friend. Ryo made school a lot more fun for him, so Chikara hopes that they can graduate together after they defeat God. Once Ryo is able to move again, he tries to get an answer from Chikara about what's going on, but he just leaves. Ryo thinks that Chikara is in trouble with bad people, so he does what a good friend should do and chases after him. Chikara tells Andy that he wants the memory thing to be done. Andy makes sure that it's what he wants, and Chikara explains that he is sure, since it will make things safer for everyone. Ryo is determined to rescue Chikara, but Nico is told to erase the kid's memory. Ryo stops right in his tracks after forgetting everything, and instead just remembers that he forgot his bag inside. Ryo heads back inside, and Chikara sobs after having to do that. Fuko tells Andy that she wants to defeat God more than ever now. That way, Chikara can go back to school again, and also so that the world doesn't come to an end. Fuko asks Andy to teach her how to fight, so he agrees. Back at Union headquarters, we see Yuiz without her helmet. It is September 16th, and she stares at the penalty tablet. Andy and Fuko just succeeded in persuading the 11th negator to join the Union. Because of this, a memory wipe was conducted on anyone that knew Chikara. Upon the request of Fuko and Chikara, a special training regimen was established for the two of them. Three months later, on December 1st, all Union members gather at the round table. With all 11 seats now filled, Yuiz calls an apocalypse to reveal the next round of quests. The day before, we see that Blind Billy has put spurs on his boots, and he explains to Tatiana that he is using them to see around him. She of course knows what he uses them for, but she is upset because he shouldn't need them when she is around. She told him that she would be his eyes no matter what, and he remembers that he does need his little friend. Back to the present, Apocalypse explains that these new quests have the 100th penalty at stake. This being the case, for this round, every quest will be open to everyone. Every living person on Earth will have the right to participate. Billy realizes that it being open to everyone shows just how significant these quests are. There are four quests this time. The first quest is the neutralization of UMA Spring, with the reward being the location of Artifact Aegis. Quest 2 is the neutralization of UMA Summer, with the reward being the location of Negator Unchange. The third quest is the capture of UMA Autumn, with the reward being the addition of UMA Ghost. The final quest is the neutralization of UMA Winter, and its reward is the location of Artifact Remember. The quest deadline is December 31st, which is a month from now. If all quests are not fulfilled by the deadline, the penalty will be the addition of UMA Revolution. Yuiz points out that people outside of the round table being able to participate means that they are facing opponents of a grand scale. She declares that everyone must unite to challenge them, but Billy interjects. These quests hold the 100th penalty, so he doubts they will be easy. He argues that since the 100th penalty is at stake, they shouldn't risk losing more members so close to the 101st penalty. Since 3 out of the 4 simply need to be neutralized, Billy suggests a simple plan to minimize risk, and that is to drop a few nukes on them. Tatiana can't believe what she is hearing, and points out how innocent people will be sacrificed if they do that. Billy retorts that that's all they'll lose, and he calls you as naive. She is always seeking a better outcome, almost as if there will be a next time. 
Billy explains that what they are trying to accomplish is impossible, even if they try thousands of times. Billy shockingly draws his guns and explains that they will never be able to kill God. He shoots at the others and bullets ricochet everywhere. Billy is stopped by the boys and Annie thinks about the strange feeling he has had since Unseen got taken. A look back shows how they failed the sixth quest in the last round. Anyone that went to investigate Unseen died. The assumption was that Unseen got taken by Unrepair. Andy then thinks about Unrepair and his group called the Unders. This group faced off against Union Roundtable members in Egypt and China. Andy thinks Unrepair might have been hinting at something, but can't believe what he thinks it is. Billy is cold-blooded and points out that their supposed leader Yu is, is slow to make a decision on what to do right now. Top panics as the was shot and Nico prepares to check on the wound. Billy brags about taking down Unbreakable, but this of course doesn't go well with the others. Andy tries to stop the kid, but Top is so enraged that he ends Billy's life with one kick. Tatiana loses it, but Top reminds her that Billy just shot Ishin and he is a traitor. Just then, everyone is stunned as Billy starts moving again. He makes a statement about the burden of negating and being forced to fight. Billy believes that as negators that are forced to fight for the world, they should be able to sacrifice the lives of the masses to achieve their goal. He considers anything else unfair. Just then, the ground shakes and Billy declares that the round table will belong to Under, as he will be taking it. Unrepair and Latla are there as well, and Billy proclaims that he will be the one to end God. Everyone stares in disbelief at the huge UMA burn, and the completely lost Fuko just now wonders if Billy betrayed them. This seems to be the case, so Fuko is worried about what Tatiana must be going through. Unrepair is glad to see his old pals again, but Ala doesn't like being called his wife. Unrepair can tell that Fuko has lost a bit of weight from training these past few months, and she graciously accepts the compliment. Unrepair crushes her though when he realizes that he was mistaken because he was just too far away to see that she looks the same. Andy has seen enough and declares that Billy must really be part of Under. Tatiana refuses to believe that's really him since none of them know a single thing about the real Billy. Top broke this guy's neck a second ago and he just repaired himself. Billy's ability doesn't work like that since his ability is called unbelievable. It's limited to guns but he has a sure hit ability. Whenever Billy shoots in a direction that would never hit its target, the bullet ricochets until it does hit. Tatiana is the only person Billy ever told about his ability and Shikara freaks out over the giant beast. There is no time to explain so Andy tells the kid to fall back. Shikara wants to help but Andy tells him that he can help by not dying. Shikara makes the smart move by running away but he promises to come back when he has calmed his nerves. Unrepair calls him a scaredy cat but is glad to see him leave since he was the one that got him last time. Bringing Burn along turned out to be a good idea and we learn that Billy is actually their boss. Tatiana still can't believe it but Top is ready to act. He uses his unstoppable ability to bounce off the walls before attacking the traitor. Billy dodges and counters easily though, but it was so fast that Andy can't figure out what's going on. Billy is impressed with Top's unstoppable ability, but points out how the shutoff condition is tricky. Billy's leg is broken from kicking Top's head, and he points out that Top can't stop his ability unless the shape of his body undergoes a dramatic change. This is why Billy had to kick him so hard. The others try to attack Billy, but Shen realizes that his ability isn't working, and he points out how he never liked this guy. The others fail to land an attack, so Andy tries his finger bullet. Billy uses the Unjustice ability to stop them, and he marvels at how good the ability is, since it allows one to peer into people's hearts. He can now see all three of their visions of justice. Yu is bound to live and lead, Shen is bound to fight powerful foes to become stronger, and Andy is bound to protect. The Unjustice ability, however, has negated their visions of justice. Yuiz realizes that this is her Unjustice ability, but has no clue how Billy is able to use it. Billy has Burn swat them away, and he calls Tatiana to his side. He tells her to come with him since he needs her ability. Tatiana remembers the day she was rescued by Billy, and when he refused to end her life like she wanted. Billy declares that he saved her life, so now it's time for her to return the favor. Tatiana then thinks about when she made her promise with Fuko to shake their real hands one day. Billy knows that she wants to have a normal body and prepares to offer her something, but he is shot and we see that it was the very angry Fuko. Fuko explains that she knows one thing very well. When a person has no sense of self-worth and someone saves their life, that saver has a huge influence on the person. What Fuko can't relate to, however, is how sad it must be for that same person to be betrayed by their savior. 
While Fuko fights for her, we see that Tatiana is weeping uncontrollably. Billy coldly determines that Tatiana won't be coming with him, so he declares that she too will now be his enemy. Billy instructs Burton to get them out of there, and Andy can tell that he plans on escaping by melting the ceiling. Yui says that they cannot let them leave, since if he steals the round table, then they lost their way to oppose God. They must do whatever it takes to get it back, and it's all over if they don't settle things right now. Andy has a ton of questions, but he will save them for later, to do as she asks. Andy is somehow excited even now, and is just glad to hear that he can use any means necessary. He tells Fuko to give him a huge unluck, and Yuis sees that he is planning to rely on Fuko's ability. Yuis points out that Burn is really strong, and wonders if they can really pull it off. Andy explains that it's their best chance, since their enemies have outlet with them. As long as she is there, regular attacks won't land. That is why they will bank on Unluck's randomness. Yuiz is convinced and prepares to see what they come up with. She gives a speech to the other members about Billy's betrayal. They must retrieve the round table at all costs and the operation will be centered around Fuko and Andy. Their top priority will be to disable Burn since they can't take the round table without him. Nico will stay to treat the wounded and grant lab members control of the facility to stop Burn. Nico leaves that job to Miko and she gets excited to finally be of use. You was instruct Shen and Phil to go to the depository in case Under try to steal artifacts on their way out. On top of that, she grants them permission to use any artifact to succeed. You was then asks Chikara to use his ability to stop her bleeding. As for Tatiana, Yu simply has her stand by. Fuko assures her that they will take care of everything and promises to find the reason behind all of this. Fuko assures her that Billy is a kind person and Tatiana must know that better than anyone. These words calm Tatiana and she asks Fuko to save Billy. Andy calls Fuko to his side, so Fuko declares one last time that they will take care of everything. Fuko and Andy go after Under, and Yuiz declares the start of the operation. She tells everyone to provide Fuko and Andy with their support, and everyone springs into action. On top of Burn's head, Unrepair is disappointed at how easy it was to take the round table. Billy warns him that it won't be that easy, however, as he explains that they just caught the Union off guard. It would be smart not to underestimate the Union, as they will surely be coming to stop them. Unrepair explains that he is surprised to just now find out that their boss has been Billy all along, as this is their first time meeting. Unrepair, whose name is actually Rip, agrees to cooperate with Billy, but makes one thing clear. Killing God is not their final objective, and what they want is what comes next. They are only there because they were promised that, and he just wants to make sure Billy won't betray them. Billy explains that they don't operate under vague motives like justice, and they only trust each other because they have mutual interests. Billy considers this fair, and Rip agrees. Elsewhere, Miko relocates all giant UMA cryo storage units above Burn's location. The guys controlling them explain that they can only use it for 10 minutes, since the other UMA will wake up if they go any longer. This is an emergency, so she also deploys anesthetic gas as a backup. Nico instructs her to add the electromagnetic cables as well, since they can buy them some time. Miko points out that they are heat sensitive, but Nico explains that all they need to do is make it look like a capture attempt. What they are really doing though, is setting up things that can be set off when Andy uses Fuko's unluck ability. Fuko's unluck ability will search out a seed of destruction equal to the size of the unluck, so their job is to create as many seeds of destruction as possible. Fuko tells Andy that they should stop Burn so they can talk it out with Billy, but he points out that she just shot the guy a minute ago. Just then, Andy must dodge some projectiles, and he admits that he does have some unanswered questions. Rip and Billy don't seem to have the same goal. If Billy wants to slay God, then it would make more sense for him to work with Union. One thing Andy is sure of though, is that Billy made Tatiana cry. He vows to punch Billy right in his face for that, and decides that they can talk it out after. They are finally getting close to Burn, and Yuiz confirms that the Seeds of Destruction are ready. Our heroes confront Billy, and he wastes no time by quickly using the Unjustice ability. Fuko warns Andy that their plan must begin now, and Unjustice forces her to take Andy's sword. Billy assumes that Unjustice will make Fuko take her own life, but we see that she's actually cutting Andy's neck. Fuko then gives him a kiss, and Andy uses his parts bullet attack with his head. Rip realizes that the kiss on Andy's head means that a huge unluck will be coming their way, and Andy's head goes right into Burn's mouth. Fuku explains that the huge unluck is coming, and everyone takes cover. 
One seat of unluck goes off, making electricity go everywhere and causing Burn major damage, but Miko has more for him. Just as planned, she freezes Burn, so they all go flying down, but Billy isn't concerned at all. He points out that this would have worked on Burn's core form, but it's no use against his fully developed body. All it's really doing is buying them some time, but Fuku explains that even bigger strokes of unluck are coming. One of Nico's underlings worries about their next move, but Miko assures him that it will be fine since they have Fuku's unluck on their side. Miko unleashes the unbreakable pile cannon, but this thing surprisingly just collapses. Fuku's unluck is not to be underestimated though, as the cannon finds a way to fire anyway. The giant projectile pierces right through Burn's body while pulling Andy out of it. Andy triumphantly explains that they have stopped Burn, so there's no way Billy's getting away. All the research nerds celebrate, and Miko shows the dweeb who doubted them who's boss. Down below, everyone celebrates. Top wants to join the fight, but Nico explains that he wouldn't be able to withstand any acceleration with his legs still recovering. Everything seems to be going well, but Jakara notices that Tatiana is missing. Up above, Andy plans to make Billy pay for making Tatiana cry, so he prepares an attack. He manages to land an insanely powerful blood rocket fueled punch, but Billy's somehow still standing. Billy realizes that he can still feel pain, which surprises him since when he observed Andy using his undead ability, he assumed that his sense of pain got dull. As Billy heals himself, he now understands that Andy was just repairing himself bit by bit. He compliments Andy as he admires how he was able to create such a unique fighting style with his ability. This little speech Billy just gave confirms what Andy was thinking. Billy is somehow able to use his undead powers. Andy then tells Fuko to give him all the weapons so she doesn't unalive herself. Lala wonders if they should help Billy, but Rip says he doesn't need it. Rip would rather just watch anyway and see if Billy is qualified to be their boss. Billy then begins his attack by moving at high speed and it becomes clear that he's using Top's unstoppable ability. It's not as refined as Top's though, so Andy is sure he can track it, but he is wrong. Billy sends him flying and explains that even if he sees it coming, he won't be able to block it in time. Billy is then the one to be surprised as he realizes that Andy chopped off his leg before being hit. Billy compliments our boy, but he knows Andy's weakness. It's Fuko, so Billy uses the Unjustice ability on her. Fuko's vision of justice is to survive, so the Unjustice ability forces her to walk off the edge. She apologizes to Andy, and he rushes off to save her. As he does, Andy thinks about all the negator abilities Billy's able to use. It's clear now that his ability allows him to copy, and he has used it on the Union members. Billy has taken care of the nuisance stopping them, and he tells Burn to stop napping. Burn heats his body up to destroy the ice covering him, and rips the projectile from his chest. Miko is stunned that they weren't actually able to pierce Burn's core, and she points out that they are all out of traps that will work against him. Burn is on the move again, and there are only 5 minutes left before they break out of the base. Yuiz tells everyone to remain calm and wonders if Fuko and Andy are okay. Surprisingly, Tatiana is the one to respond and she explains that she caught both of them while they were falling. Fuko thanks her but Yuiz reminds Tatiana that she was supposed to remain on standby. Tatiana apologizes as she must disobey orders because she needs to talk to Billy. While all this is going on, we see that Top is planning to go as well and Chikara asks to go with him. Yuiz wants to know if Tatiana still has feelings for Billy and explains that the entire operation hinges on her answer. Up above, we see that Burn and the other Unders have escaped. Tatiana arrives to instantly attack Billy and she demands to know why he betrayed them. Billy's answer is simple. So long as God and the rules exist, this world will always be unfair. Tatiana tries to say something else, but Billy silences her. He tells her that she doesn't matter and uses the Unjustice ability. Tatiana now answers you is and declares that she does still care for Billy. She unleashes her untouchable area compulsory, which causes her barrier to immediately expand. Billy is thrown back and he is shocked since the Unjustice ability should be active. If she is acting with justice on the behalf of the Union, then it should stop her attack. Billy can see that Tatiana is crying from having to hurt him and realizes now that the attack is actually going against her vision of justice. Tatiana retreats into her machine and Billy realizes that they got him. Their target was actually Apocalypse and Fugo just manages to grab a hold of the crazy book. Andy points out that the quest start when members are seated at the round table and Billy must have been planning to use it somehow. However, without Apocalypse, Billy won't be able to accept any quest or their rewards. Apocalypse calls them morons as he has a gun in his mouth and something happens to Fuko. 
She has some mysterious visions of events that happen differently, and she screams in pain. Apocalypse explains he has more years of memories than any other artifact, and tells Fuko to enjoy losing her mind to all of them. Apocalypse makes his great escape, but he is caught. He tells his captor that he will flood their mind with memories just like he did to Fuko, but it doesn't work, since the one who caught him was Phil, who has the unfeel ability. Just then, Shen arrives on his flying Nimbus, and Andy can't believe that he's able to ride on it. Billy calls out to Andy and tells him that he will allow them to borrow Apocalypse for now. They really just need to get it back by the deadline anyway, but he reveals that they will be securing Ark. He refuses to let Yuas have it, but the boys have no clue what Ark is. Rip is glad to see that things are finally getting fun and undermake their escape. Andy informs Yuas that they are getting away, but she tells him not to follow them. She has an important matter to discuss with everyone and asks everyone to return. Fuko is in really bad shape, so Andy agrees to just go back. When everyone gathers, Apocalypse gets really upset, but his words go unheard as he is imprisoned. Nico explains that all things considered, things aren't as bad as they thought. If another fight had broken out, things could have gotten a lot worse, so forcing a draw by stealing Apocalypse was definitely the right call. As for Fuko, he predicts that she will settle down soon enough, as the human brain is a remarkable thing. With that settled, Andy states that he has felt that something has been off for a while. It all started when Yuas made her decision regarding the quests that had Galaxy as the penalty. Apocalypse warned about the addition of UMA Galaxy if they failed to complete all the quests. Yuas decided that they would only complete the first three quests and simply accept the penalty. Her reason was that it would be impossible to complete all the quests, so they would just focus on strengthening their forces with the rewards from the first three quests. However, looking back now, Andy thinks her decision was way too casual, considering the seriousness of the situation. She would run the risk of losing members for the round table, but with Ragnarok drawing near, Andy thinks she was being way too passive. At that time, rules had been added to Earth 98 times. Receiving UMA Galaxy marked the moment that the 99th penalty was added. This only left them with one spot left on the tablet until it reaches 100. Beyond that lies the final penalty called Ragnarok, so it's strange that she would casually just decide to take the galaxy penalty. Shen has some questions for Yuiz as well, but his have to do with Victor. He always thought that Yuiz only knew Victor as a hero that existed before they were all born. However, that didn't seem to be the case when they called each other by name during battle. Andy had not let Victor out fully in almost 200 years, so it's strange that she would be so familiar with him. Furthermore, Victor seemed to know of Galaxy's existence before the rule was even added. It was almost as if he had lived in a world where Galaxy already existed. They aren't the only ones with questions, as Nico is curious about the Ark thing Billy mentioned. The Union doesn't have any information about an artifact named Ark, but Billy valued it more than anything. Yuiz removes her helmet, causing Andy to prepare his sword, but she tells everyone not to worry. In this state, her ability won't be an issue, unless they answer a question from her regarding justice. Yuiz has something to tell them about the world they all live in, and it's a great secret that she has been keeping from everyone. She reveals that this world is on a loop. It's in a constant cycle of destruction and renewal by God's hand. The Union is an organization that Yuiz created to put a stop to this loop. This is a lot of information for the group to take in, as they realize that this means the world is repeating the same events over and over again. Things begin to make sense for Fuko, since the images from artifacts are from before things were recreated. A look back shows the visions from when Fuko held the gun in Apocalypse. Yuiz considers these images from the history of her failures that led to defeat. Fuko thinks she is being too hard on herself, but Yuiz credits these failures for being the reason she assembled this group. They were all encountered over the course of countless deaths, the strongest weapons and warriors. These failures have finally allowed her to assemble the negators capable of killing God. Andy is still skeptical of the whole story, and he wonders why she's the only one who knows about it. It's especially strange since they are all negators there, but none of them know anything about this loop. Tatiana agrees since as negators, they should be aware of the world before it changed. In times past, any alterations that were made by Apocalypse, all memories were altered except for those of the negators. That's exactly what happened when all languages were unified to English. Top points out that it could be from before they were born, but Nico is the oldest one among them, and even he doesn't know about it. 
Yuiz explains that there are a number of ways to find out about the loop. However, in her case, she has been using Ark to experience the loop firsthand. Andy remains skeptical and asks for some proof. Yuiz isn't sure if she has sufficient proof, but she will try to convince them by describing how the world will end and begin. The end will come when the planet and all life are physically destroyed by God. It will all be blown to bits and not even flying into space can save them. Everyone will die and a new planet will be formed by God. In some versions of the loop, fragments of the old earth will remain around the new earth. These are the meteorites that Foucault's unluck uses. Foucault remembers all the time she summoned meteorites and is shocked to realize that they were fragments of the old world. Foucault was taught that meteorites form when the moon separated from the earth, but she was taught wrong. Yuiz explains that if they were to examine one of the meteorites that Foucault summons, they would surely conclude that the earth had once shattered. That is all Yuiz has to offer as proof of the world looping, and she apologizes if that isn't enough for them. In order to prove her own loop though, she shocks everyone by pointing out that Andy has a mole behind his ear. Andy doesn't even know about it, but Foucault confirms it. Yuiz realizes that this might not be much proof, but not many things stay the same from the previous cycle. Fuku and Chikara are still stunned that Yuiz knew about Andy's mole, so Fuku wonders what that means. Andy tries to calm her down and explains that he wasn't involved in any of it. Andy realizes that this actually means that Yuiz and Victor were pretty close. Yuiz explains that it's ancient history, but Fuku is clearly still hot and bothered. Andy tries to calm her down again, but she says that she is calm. Fuku then tries to sum everything up by recapping how the world has been repeatedly getting destroyed and everyone keeps dying. Yuiz uses the Ark thing, so she's the only one that is able to survive and travel to the next new world. Fuku has most of it right, but Yuiz corrects her and reveals that she was not alone. Andy has it figured out and reveals that Yuiz is talking about Victor. The loop destroys and reconstructs the planet, killing everyone, but Andy never dies. So Yuiz has been using the Ark to survive, but Victor has been living in this world ever since the rule of death was added. This means that even if the entire world were to end, Andy will never be able to get the death he has always wanted. Yuiz explains that there are two ways to avoid the rules. One is by dying, and the other is by killing God. Everyone is shocked as they finally begin to believe her, and Nishin gets back to carving something. Yuiz acknowledges that she has withheld many secrets and manipulated the very people who risked their lives alongside her. Billy's betrayal was likely because news of this loop got out somehow. Yuiz takes full responsibility and would like to atone for her wrongdoing by taking her own life. There are things that must be done though, so she asks that they all continue to follow her until the very end. Top doesn't like to see her groveling like this, and he was as shocked when her body stands up on its own. It's because Shen used his ability on her, and he explains that he'd rather not see their leader behave this way. The others agree that it's not necessary, and Ishin finishes up crafting a makeshift round table. Everyone takes a seat, and Andy channels his inner Steph Curry to shoot the caged up apocalypse right to the center of the table. It's time to get started, so Shen gives the boss her helmet back. With everyone seated, Yuiz declares that the round table meeting will now begin. There are currently four quests in progress. They are the neutralization of UMA Spring, Summer, and Winter, and the capture of UMA Autumn. Before that though, they must first find the location of the real round table that Billy took. She would also like it if they could pinpoint the location of the Ender's base of operations. Also, because of Billy's idea to use nuclear weapons to complete quests, it's very likely that leaving him unchecked will lead to many lives being sacrificed. This means that they must apprehend Billy and crush Under. She is certain that Billy's organization has made their own progress towards ending God, so she wants them to take all their artifacts as well. With that in mind, Yuiz has a special request for Andy and Fuko. Fuko is eager to help in any way she can, but she gets confused when Yuiz explains further. She wants them to check the legitimacy of a certain book since there is a chance that the secrets of the future and the past are written inside of it. Since Billy betrayed them, Yuiz doesn't know what the future holds. In order to clear these four quests in this uncertain situation, the book will be very important. This is quite the task, so Fuku wonders if the two of them are really the right people for the job. Yuiz points out that they are actually the perfect people for the job. The reason for this will be immediately clear when she shows them the book, 
so Foucault is stunned when Yuas pulls out the book Foucault is very familiar with. This book is the book Foucault considers to be her life's bible. It's the masterpiece made by someone named Anno, and it is titled To You From Me. Yuas pulls out one volume in particular from the Space Soccer Club Invasion arc. Inside it, the Space Soccer Club is about to blow up the entire school, but the team's captain stops them with their spiral shot of justice kick. This is eerily close to what happened when the aliens invaded Earth and Yuas stopped them. That isn't the only similarity, as several other volumes mimic events that happened in real life. Yuas declares that this needs to be investigated, but Top wonders if she is being serious. He has never even heard of this Yumi book, but Foucault quickly educates him. It's the gold standard for long-running sci-fi shoujo manga. It even has battles in it, so Tatiana recommends that Top read it. There are 101 volumes, but no one knows what happens beyond the manga. There isn't even any information on the author. Yuas predicts that Yumi was drawn with an artifact called G-Liner, so this should mean that the objects drawn are not affected by the addition of new rules. If this is true, this means that the raw manuscript for the manga didn't change during the language unification, and it should still be in Japanese. Yuas wants Andy and Fuko to investigate the status of the raw manuscript and gather intel on the author. Meanwhile, we see that Top took the other's recommendation, and he's enjoying the manga. Andy determines that the best place to conduct their investigation is at the publisher of You Me. He doubts that they will just show them what they want, so he shocks everyone with his plan to create a manga of their own to show the publisher. Nico has a room prepared for them to work, and Andy gives Miko a list of the things he needs. Fuko and Andy get to work on their manga, but Fuko quickly gets stressed out. She realizes how impossible this will be, and wonders why she has to be the one to do this. Foucault's used to being a blissful connoisseur of fiction, but being a writer is much more different than being a reader. Andy then shocks her when he reveals that he actually has a bit of experience making mangas. He has set up an outline for them to follow, and declares that he has composition and background art covered. However, the base of it all is the rough draft. That part takes a lot of passion, and Foucault's the one with the most shoujo manga experience. Andy tells her to just imagine some boyfriend and come up with some situations that would make her blush. It's quite the task, but Foucault's determined to get it done. Sometime later, Andy admits that he's surprised she's able to write this kind of story because usually she would get embarrassed. Foucault refuses to let her shyness get in the way, especially because their mission is so important. If the Yumi book really holds the secrets of the future, then it might be able to help them stop Billy. Fuko doesn't just want to stop him for Tatiana, she hopes that making this manga will help her understand her own feelings better. If she can do that, she might be able to summon even stronger strokes of unluck. Several Red Bulls later, Fuko waits patiently as Andy reads her work. She would rather he not read it so thoroughly, but Andy loves it. Andy declares that he will have the storyboard done in one hour, so everyone needs to be ready to draw. Fuko had no clue others would be helping, and she is shocked when Mui and Miko arrive. Nexilla offers his services as well, but Andy tells him to just go back to pumping iron, as his powers are too dangerous. Fuko points out that mangas take a really long time to make, but Andy had Miko prepare something. Miko surprises Fuko with brainwave-operated robot arms. Andy declares that they will help her get the job done six times faster, but they just manage to tear his pants off first. Fuko has no clue how to control them, but Andy points out that she will have one hour to figure it out. After some time, Fuko's ready to give up, but Tatiana arrives to help her. Tatiana has a ton of experience using brainwave operated arms and declares that it's time for some intense training. More time passes and Fuko thanks Tatiana for showing her how to use the arms. They embrace each other using their countless number of arms and Fuko offers to let Tatiana help out with the manga. Just then, Andy arrives with the finished storyboard and everyone starts drawing. It's an intense process, and everyone works frantically using their octopus arms. Their manga slowly begins to come together, and we get a glimpse of our boy Shen getting a good pump going. The other union members are doing their own thing, and we see that Top hasn't stopped reading You Me. Yu is arrives to help out, and Fuko tells her that she went back and read You Me after hearing that it was a book of prophecies. However, there was nothing in it about Billy's betrayal or their current set of quests. Instead, she only found gaps. The closer she got to the climax of some parts, the more she encountered plot holes. It's almost as if parts were missing, so Fuko wonders if the author left them out on purpose. Yuiz casually asks which frame she needs to work on next, but Fuko is stunned by how much faster she is than her. 
After even more time passes, we find that everyone is exhausted and Tatia's even fuming. Fuko is still hard at work though and more determined than ever. Miko is still observing his research and Top is out cold. Our boy Shen is exhausted from working out so much, but he just keeps on going. Fuko patiently waits once again as Andy checks on the work and he is clearly satisfied. Fuko finally allows herself to rest and their manga is finished. Sometime later, Andy and Fuko arrive at the building of the publishing company. Andy offers to go inside with Fuko, but she points out that he doesn't really look the part of a shoujo manga artist. Their whole goal is to gain credibility, so she insists on going alone. Andy agrees to patiently wait outside, but we see that this affected him more than he made it seem. Inside, Fuko is met by Tamako, and she takes a look at their manga that they decided to call Undead Plus Unluck. Fuko explains that the plus is silent, and she patiently waits to hear what the woman has to say. Fuko is stunned when Tamako wonders how long it took her to make, and Fuko knows that she can't tell her that it only took her one day. She doesn't know the standard amount of time that it takes, so she just tells Tamako that it took her a week. Tamako is stunned that she drew it that fast and at how refined the composition is. The composition turns out to be the only good thing about it, as Tamako absolutely destroys all the other parts. This hurts Fuko to the core since Andy did the composition and she was responsible for all the other stuff that Tamako is currently putting down. At the end of it all though, Tamako thinks it's charming and she can feel how much Fuko loves the hero of the story. Tamako wonders if she based him on someone real, but she realizes how foolish of a question that was since she couldn't possibly have a zombie boyfriend. Tamako offers to submit it to a contest as she thinks it would do well. This excites Fuko, but she reveals that she actually has a request. Fuko tells her that she is a fan of Yumi, and Tamako takes her through their office. Usually what Tamako is about to do is not allowed, but Fuko is ecstatic since she is going to show her the raw manuscript. This is a pretty big deal because these days things are usually done with digital manuscripts. Tamako retrieves it, but she gets confused when she can't read the writing. Fuko informs the others that the manuscript is in Japanese, and this confirms that it's a book of prophecy. Tamako is surprised to hear that Fuko was able to tell that there were some rejected storylines, so Fuko just explains it away by pointing out that there were some awkward progressions in the later parts of the story. Tamako is amazed by how attentive Fuko is, and reveals that three arcs are missing from the manga. They are the Kohei's Betrayal arc, the Four Kings of the Four Seasons arc, and the Ando's Past arc. Yui springs into action and demands that Andy and Fuko get into contact with the author of Yumi, whose name is Ano. Details about the future have been left out intentionally and she demands that they find out why. Under definitely doesn't have this information, so this is how they can get the upper hand. Fuko points out that they have no clue where Ano is, but she is stunned when Tamako just calls Ano up. She informs Ano that something strange happened to the manuscript and also about how a winner needs to be selected for the contest. Fuko doesn't hold back and asks to speak with Ano. Tamako refuses at first, but Andy appears to intimidate her so she gives in. Fuko explains to Ano that she would like for them to read her manga. She even offers to go to them, but Ano doesn't respond. Tamako explains that it's hopeless since Ano doesn't speak to others, and she hasn't even seen them before. Just then, Tamako is shocked when Ano asks Fuko if her manga is any good. Ano states that if her manga is an interesting read, then they will agree to meet with Fuko. Ano instructs her to come to a bench in Canada in 5 hours, and she surprisingly tells her to bring her friend. Tamako is stunned because this is the first time she has heard Ano's voice. Fuko looks at a picture of the bench as our heroes leave, and we see that Tamako's memory of them has been erased. Later, we jump right into the battle against UMA Autumn. Andy takes some damage, causing books to grow out of his leg, but he cuts it off. The fight gets a bit more crowded as Under appears, and Rip declares that they will be taking UMA Autumn. Things escalate even more when Autumn's minions also appear. Andy decides to finally use the unluck they have been charging up, so Fuko gives him a peck on the cheek and leaves his side. However, just then, Fuko is killed, and we get a glimpse of the person responsible. A look back at Ano shows that this was the future that he knows will happen. Ano answers his phone, and we see that we are back to just before Fuko spoke with Ano. The exact same thing happens as before, and Ano agrees to meet with Fuko and Andy. The story continues as our heroes discuss how Ano seems to know about the two of them. It takes 9 hours to get to Canada from where they are, but Ano somehow knew that Union technology could get them there in 3 hours. This stranger is clearly not a normal person, and Fuko wonders if they will really be able to meet them. 
They have no information on this person, and no one even knows what they look like. This person submitted the first chapter of You and Me 20 years ago. It was only supposed to be a one-time special, but it was a smash hit, so the publisher gave it a recurring slot. This person only communicates with the editorial using silent phone calls and letters. The union hasn't even been able to find this person, so they have piqued Andy's interest. Andy declares that they will find them at all costs, and Fuko agrees. Hours later, our pair arrives in Canada, and Fuko points out that it looks like Autumn. It's December 15th, and a look around shows that it only looks like Autumn in one area. The two wait at the bench, but Anno isn't there yet, so they share a Canadian delicacy. It's called poutine, and Fuko thinks it's delicious. Anno should be arriving any time now, so Andy reminds Fuko that they need to be ready if things get hostile. Andy defines hostile as the person getting a bit too close, or pulling out weapons. They are so deep in conversation that they don't even realize that Anno has arrived, and taken the copy of the manga they made. Anno reads it, and Andy tells Fuko to shoot the person in the leg if things get bad. Andy would rather it not come to that, but they can't afford to take any risks just in case Anno is a negator or artifact wielder. Anno can no longer hold back his interest in their manga, and he shocks our heroes. Andy can't believe that he was able to get so close without him noticing, and Anno critiques their manga. Anno then reveals that he already knows what they want to ask him. They want to know why Billy betrayed them and how to defeat the four UMAs. They also want to know more about Andy's mysterious past and how to defeat God. Anno reveals that he does in fact know all the answers, but there's a steep price to pay. Fuko tries to warn him when monsters appear, but Anno just explains that Autumn spawned them. Those things are just juniors, and they already claim this territory. Anno reveals that the two of them will battle Autumn and learn about themselves. Once they come to know each other better, they will become several times stronger. That is the only hint he gives them, so he states that they must take the prize on their own. He declares that it's time for the UMA Autumn arc to begin, and he uses an ink brush to draw a guillotine. It becomes real, and he uses it to eliminate the spawn. This crazy guy then tells them that they must show him the ultimate ending that he won't see coming. He is covered in monster goo, but he shows them that he kept their manga nice and clean. Before they go off to fight Adam, he would like to talk about their manuscript. He gets excited as there is a bunch of stuff to praise about their manga, but also a lot to criticize. Anno goes into detail, but our heroes are not amused. Andy wonders if Fuku is still a fan of Anno's, which she is, but just barely. Andy takes his sword to his face and demands that he tell them if he knows the future. Also, if he does, then Andy wants to know what his goal is and why he is hiding it. Andy is then shocked when he disappears and goes to return the manuscript back to Fuku. Andy thinks about all the possibilities that would allow Anno to teleport, but he can't figure it out. Anno tells the angry Fuko that Autumn should be arriving soon. They hear someone scream, so Fuko runs off, but Anno tries to stop her. Anno explains that the two of them can't fully utilize their powers yet, so they stand no chance of defeating Autumn. Fuko isn't worried about winning or losing though, she's only worried about innocent people. She knows that once a UMA transforms a human, there is no changing back. This was the case with UMA Spoil, who transferred the teacher into a zombie. The memory of how the teacher sacrificed herself is burned into Fuko's mind forever, and she declares that she needs to save more people. Andy drags Anno along with him, and he is inspired by Fuko's words. This is the spirit needed to make progress, but Anno points out that stopping to train is also important. They arrive to find Yuume Autumn, who Anno explains feeds on human biography. The guy that screamed gets attacked by Autumn, and a book grows out of his face. Our heroes are then stunned when they realize that this monster turns people into books and reads them. Autumn declares that this human book is boring and it devours the guy. Autumn desperately wants a more interesting story and would like a story that no one knows. It sends out more of its spawn, so Andy tells Fuko to grab onto him. Andy wants to use the same strategy they used against Burn. Charge up some unluck and then Andy enters its body. Then they will just deal the damage and the fight will end. It turns out to be a lot harder to get to this beast, and things get even more difficult when Autumn closes off every hole in its body. Andy decides that they just have to make a hole, and prepares his finger bullet. Anno already knows that it won't work though, and points out that they lack ideas. Andy's bullet doesn't even make a scratch, and he must cut off his leg when it gets turned into a book. Andy and Fuko get surrounded, and Anno reiterates how their plan won't work. They are both caught up in the rules. 
They assume things work in certain ways, so much that they end up establishing more rules on their own. This crazy guy doesn't suffer from that apparently, as he tosses his inkbrush into the air and slices his own arm off. He then draws Andy's arm and places it on his body. He doesn't think a negator should bind themselves to the rules, since all it takes is a little effort and inspiration to grow. Anno uses his new Andy arm, but he is more creative and uses an attack called Volcano Bullet. This attack makes a hole in Autumn, and Anno makes a plane to fly around in. Anno catches our hero, but it's clear that his attack didn't even phase Autumn. It easily regenerates its eye, and Anno declares that it's time to retreat. They make their escape, but we see that Under was there as well. Anno couldn't be more excited after that fight, but Andy just wonders if his arm is going to grow back. Anno doesn't seem concerned at all, but reveals that it won't be growing back. He can only materialize one drawing at a time, so Fuko wonders why he did something so extreme. Fuko then feels bad when Anno explains that he did it because they wouldn't have listened to him otherwise. He keeps his positive attitude though, and points out that he doesn't need his left arm to write manga. They are indebted to him now though, so he declares that it's time to kick off their training arc. Anno takes them to his house and shows them his workroom. He makes a Union emblem to contact Union and reports back about everything. Anno asks for permission to train Andy and Fuko, but Yuiz declines. Yuiz doesn't trust him and points out that they just want their questions answered. Anno explains that his strategy guide only lists a bad ending and Fuko and Andy were powerless against Autumn. There is no future unless they take a gamble. Anno states that Yuiz has assembled the perfect cast and he would hate for Yuiz to waste them on a bad ending. Fuko takes the initiative and tells Yuiz that she trusts Anno. Fuko screaming did some serious damage to Anno's eardrum, but Fuko explains to Yuiz that Anno sacrificed his life to save them. Andy agrees and tells Yuiz that he trusts him as well. On top of that, he said he knows about his past. Andy has always been bothered by the power gap between himself and Victor. He believes that the key to closing that gap lies somewhere in the past that he is not aware of. He isn't sure about what kind of training Anno is talking about, but if it holds the answers that he's looking for, then he's willing to try. Yuiz agrees to let them train, but only if they promise to come back safe after capturing Autumn. They agree so it's time to start training. Anno shocks them when he materializes one of Autumn's claws. Autumn turns people into books, which for some reason means that they can contact their past with the claw. He confirms that the key to Andy powering up is in the past, so Andy tells him to hurry up and hit him. Anno cuts him with the claw, so Andy turns into a bunch of books. Andy's book isn't just any normal book though, as his book grows all the way into space. This even surprises Anno, and Fuku is more shocked than ever. Anno assumes that Andy's giant book tower is this big, because it must contain Victor's portion as well. Basically, what it says is that he has lived for a really, really long time. Fuku can't believe that she will have to read all of it to learn about Andy's past, but Anno reveals that this is not the case. Instead of trying to read the giant book, Fuku will have to go inside of it. Of course, Fuku is confused, but this confusion quickly turns to shock when Anno separates Fuku's soul from her body by using an artifact. It's called Soul Calibur, and it plucks out people's souls and seals them inside of objects. Anno takes a hold of Fuku's soul and declares that she will learn more about herself and Andy. Furthermore, Andy will gain a deeper understanding of her, and he will be able to re-examine his own past. In simpler terms, Fuku will find out why the Andy she knows was born. Inside the book of Andy's memories, Fuku finds herself in a desert. Someone tells her not to move, as he mistakes her for some kid that got away. This guy only speaks English, and Nico's necktie doesn't seem to be changing her speaking language. Fuku tries to do her best to speak English, but she remembers that she didn't pay too much attention in English class. The guy shoots at her, but Fuku is luckily rescued by Andy from the past. This Andy hasn't met Fuku yet, so he assumes that she was just another one of the kids he was rescuing. The kids have never seen her before though, so Fuku tries to talk to him. She is glad that Andy can speak Japanese, but she realizes that he wasn't known as Andy at this point in his past. One of Andy's subordinates is named Josh, and she must be told to let Fuku go. Josh accidentally touched Fuku's hair, so Fuku fears that a stroke of unluck is coming, but the stroke of unluck just ends up being her getting pooped on by a bird. Predicting this would happen makes Josh think Fuku is a witch, so Fuku realizes that she will have to try to earn their trust before Josh blows her brains out. Fuku does this by detailing all of Andy's tattoos. This just makes Andy's subordinates more suspicious of her, but past Andy decides to let her live. 
The group returns the children to their families, and they are all very grateful. Fuko is really impressed with Josh's ability to speak Japanese, and she explains that their captain taught her. Her goal is to one day meet a samurai and have a fight with them. Andy's group is treated to free food and drinks as thanks for saving the children. They decide to have a drinking competition, but Josh just ends up out drinking the big guy and the kid. Andy explains that things have gotten really bad since the Civil War, so his group travels around to beat up bad people that have bad intentions. However, Josh points out that this is not the truth. She explains that he doesn't remember his past, so that is really why he's roaming around the world. He is hoping to find someone that knows about who he was. As for his three subordinates, they were saved by Andy, and they're just trying to help him any way they can. That is why they are taking what Fuko said very seriously, and Andy now wants to know how she knew about his tattoos. Fuko explains that in the future, Andy never wears clothes. Past Andy doesn't think he would ever be that way, so this just makes him even more skeptical of her. Fuko tries to explain how he fights in the future, but they don't buy it. They know that Andy can heal quickly, but they are sure that he is not immortal. This makes Fuko realize that in this era, Andy hasn't figured out that he is undead yet. Fuko knows that they won't trust her unless she risks her life by their side, so she shocks them when she asks to join their group. Everyone gets very serious as they know that their ritual is coming, and Andy removes all the bullets from his gun except for one. Andy instructs Fuko to aim the gun at her head and pull the trigger. If she lives, then she can join. Fuko barely even hesitates and manages to survive firing the weapon. Everyone is then shocked though when she tries again. Fuko starts pulling the trigger even more times, startling everyone, and Josh rushes to stop the crazy girl. Fuko tells her to calm down and reveals that Andy didn't really put the bullet back into the gun. He almost tricked her, but Fuko realized that the Andy she knows wouldn't put a non-fighter through something like this. Fuko determines that he really is the same Andy, and his head bleeds for some reason. Josh can't believe how much Fuko trusted him, but it's enough to get her to vote to let Fuko join them. The rest of the gang seems to be happy about it as well, but Josh is then shocked by something. Several attackers have appeared, so Josh protects Fuko as they open fire on our group. The bandits thank the woman for getting them all drunk, and they declare that they will no longer mess with the kids. Josh is really injured, but she just wants to know if Andy's really okay in the future. She's glad to hear that Andy is more than okay, and he is very happy. Fuko tears up as Josh passes away, and she hears Andy's voice. He asks for permission to take a pair of axes, and he leaves to get revenge. As Fuko runs after him, she realizes that learning more about Andy means learning about the numerous farewells he has had to say. Andy finishes getting his revenge, and explains that melee attacks make more sense to him now that he knows he is undead. If he is not going to die, then he couldn't care less about the pain. Later, Andy apologizes for Fuko having to help bury his friends, but Fuko felt like she had to since Josh saved her. The woman from the tavern apologizes for being forced into helping the bandits, so Fuko tries to stop Andy from getting revenge on the townspeople too. Everyone is shocked however when Andy just instructs her to place some bottles on their grave every year from now on. If she does this until the day she dies, then Andy assures her that his friends won't blame her for what she did. After they leave, Fuko points out how nice Andy is. The woman would have blamed herself for the rest of her life, but Andy gave her a way to make amends. Andy plays it off though and explains that he just wanted her to suffer. Fuko assumes that she is part of Andy's team now, but he plans to drop her off at the next town. This never happened though as the two would go on many adventures. Fuko describes this time as a dream, almost like she became a character in a book. However, the entire time, Andy never cracked a smile or talked about his past. One day, Fuko was tasked with welcoming newcomers into their group, so she shows them how her unlock ability works. Fuko takes Andy some food, but he reminds her that he doesn't like her calling him by that name when his men are around. She explains that she just finished performing the unlock ritual on the new members, and Andy is somehow able to predict exactly how it went. Andy then gets serious to explain how he thinks that people can be considered dead when they stop thinking. Thinking allows people to challenge and change, so when a person can't do that anymore is when they are really dead. Fuko views things differently though, as she believes that people only truly die when people stop remembering them. Fuko concedes that she accidentally killed both her parents with her unlock ability, but they still live on in her heart. They're always telling her that it wasn't her fault, and how something wonderful will happen to her if she just keeps living. 
She assumes that it's just a fantasy she created to escape the weight of her sins, but she credits her parents for always helping her out even to this day. This is why she can't consider them as being dead, and she is sure that Josh and the others are alive inside Andy's heart too. Fuko is then shocked to see past Andy smile for the first time as he agrees with her and she can't believe that her hard work is finally starting to pay off. Andy then gets real serious and explains that his oldest memory is from April 15th, 1865. Andy knows that Fuko will be going there next, but he's sure he will be fine now that he knows he won't ever be alone. Andy prepares to kiss her, but she explains that the Andy she loves is in the future. Fuko is shocked when she realizes that she just said that she loves Andy, but past Andy points out that she's beginning to fade away. Fuko is being taken even further into the past, but she explains to Andy that they will meet again 144 years from now. It will be at a train station, and she will try to run away from him. She instructs him to catch her, and if he does, then she will kiss him then. She pleads for him not to forget, and in classic Andy fashion, he calls it wicked sick. Fuko then arrives at her next destination, Washington DC. Elsewhere, we see a young Yuez telling Victor about reincarnation. She explains that souls are able to live for a long time, and they just get reborn into a new body when a person dies. Victor has never believed in that kind of stuff, but Yuez wants him to start. She wants to believe that she will be able to see him again when she dies, but she promises never to forget him either way. Victor then has a vision of Yuez stabbing him with the card, and we see him again as he makes a promise to Yuez never to relinquish to anyone. Victor then appears before Fuko. He declares that these are all his memories from here on out, so she needs to leave. Fuko refuses to leave as she needs to find out what happened here, and she reminds him that these are Andy's memories too. She threatens him with her gun and proclaims that she must find out why Andy was born. Yu is easily avoids her and states that he will end her life now. She will wake up in the next chapter of Victor's memories where he will just eliminate her again. Victor declares that he will keep taking her life until he drives her to the final chapter and then he will crush and erase her soul while it's still in the book. Fuko realizes that she poses no threat to him and she would just like to know what good it would do to kill her. Victor explains that killing her will weaken Andy's mind and he will use that opportunity to take control of Andy's body. Fuko concedes that she realizes that she is powerless before him and Victor commends her for having a good spirit. Unfortunately for her, Victor just has goals he must accomplish and Fuko can only blame her bad luck for having met Andy in the first place. Victor reminds her that she will at least be able to run until the very end and he eliminates her. Fuko then wakes up on August 1st, 2020. This is the day that Fuko met Andy, and we see that Victor is there as well, and he wants to ruin the memory. Victor eliminates the Fuko that was in the memory, and looks to find the real Fuko. Fuko realizes that this is her last chance, so she rushes towards the bridge where she first met Andy. She refuses to die, as she still hasn't given Andy anything back in return for saving her, and she calls out to him. Victor determines that searching for her will be too much trouble, so he will just eliminate everyone in the memory all at once. This guy uses a crazy attack called Deadline, and it causes massive destruction to the entire city. The attack isn't over as even the leftover drops of blood act as bombs. Victor thinks it was a success, as Unluck is surely dead, which means she won't be able to meet Andy. Just then, we see that Andy actually saved her, and he launches an attack at Victor. Victor calls him foolish for using such a weak attack, but he's shocked when he realizes that it's a different attack, and it does massive damage. Fuko clings to Andy, but she realizes that it will cause a stroke of unluck. They decide that she just won't be able to let him go, and they watch as Victor heals himself. Andy realizes that this is the Victor Fuko told him about, and the person that is his main personality. Victor explains that he must eliminate Fuko because she is trying to peek into his past, but it works out for him anyway, since he wants to take over Andy's body. Victor has business to take care of on the outside, and reveals that he must kill someone. Andy can't be sure of what his outside self thinks about Fuko, but she has changed his view on a lot of things. He knows how important she is, so he declares that he must deliver her to his future self, and he will defend her until it kills him. Victor is insanely powerful, and shows it by using some kind of automatic finger bullet attack. The two end up in a deadlock, and Victor is impressed to see that Andy has mastered solidifying his blood. They fight some more, and Victor gets even more impressed when he realizes that Andy is boosting his speed by spraying blood from his joints. Victor credits Fuko for Andy's improvement, but he declares that it won't be enough. 
he pushes Andy back and uses Deadline again. The two then use the same attack where they launch a ton of blood at each other. Victor commends Andy for learning so much in the past 140 years, but once again declares that it won't be enough. Victor is just using one arm while Andy is using both of his, and Victor is still overpowering him. Andy never seems bothered by anything, and simply tells Fuko to let go of him. Fuko refuses since she fears what her huge stroke of unluck will do to him, but he assures her that everything will be fine. Fuko has shattered his views on life and death, so he wants Fuko to get out of there and relay that message to his future self. Andy is sure that they have built up enough unluck, but Fuko decides to build up some more with a kiss. Fuko takes off running, so Victor thinks about what he should do next. He knows that a huge unluck is coming, so he wonders if he should just blow everything away. Andy doesn't let him think too much though, as he fires off his finger bullets and allows Victor's attack to wipe away his body. Victor is disappointed by the weak attack, but he's shocked when one of the fingers causes a stroke of unluck. Andy reveals that he loaded his soul into his fingers, so the unluck resides in them. Andy uses another finger, and the unluck causes a train to hit them both. Andy explains that he has always repaired himself from his head because he just assumed that he needed his brain to live. Andy's thought process has changed, and Victor is shocked when he sees that he can now repair himself from his torso. Andy then uses another twisting attack to send Victor flying. He explains that after meeting Fuko, he learned to stop letting logic dictate his life. Instead, he learned that he could live in this world however he pleased. Andy is completely different than Victor, as he believes that souls are what give people life. This means that it doesn't matter how his body gets destroyed, he can come back from anywhere. Andy's doing some serious damage with just his one arm, and he explains that all that matters is how they perceive the rules. As long as they believe in that, their abilities will develop as much as they want. Andy returns his arm to his body, but he leaves one finger behind. The unluck on that finger causes the Union plane to appear out of nowhere and crush Victor. Fuko points out how they won't be able to kill him, but he's pretty unlucky now as the device that was once used to capture Andy falls from the plane. Victor is captured and he wonders if Yuuz is right as there is something special about his two opponents. Andy points out that he wasn't able to escape from the device, but Victor is different and he will eventually break free. Fuko explains that she wants to learn more about Andy, so she needs to speak with Victor to hear about his memories. Andy knows that Victor can break out whenever he wants, so he tells him to come out. Victor does, but Fuko must demand that he put on some clothes. Fuko would first like to know what Victor's relationship with Yuuz is, because they were working together in one of her visions. Victor realizes that Apocalypse showed her something she should not have seen, and admits to creating union with Yuuz. Fuko wonders why he opposes them now, but he just points out that she is a lot like you is. She doesn't fear danger when she should, and she's willing to sacrifice everything for those she cares about. Andy and Fuko remind him of how they were when he first started union with you is. Things went well at first, but it soon became clear to him that they wouldn't be able to win. Even after hundreds of millions of years passed, God's life was still out of their grasp. Victor admits that they should have given up, since they were really just dancing in the palm of God's hand. Yuuz refused to give up, so she boarded the Ark and looped over and over again. Victor thought that she should just save herself the trouble by dying, so that is why he decided to kill her. Fuko of course can't understand, so Victor explains that no man can stand to see the woman he loves suffering. Yuuz won't give up until she dies, so he thought that he didn't have any other choice. However, Fuko and Andy have changed his mind. The last stroke of unluck they just used was a sign of evolution. They realized that the unluck they were using wouldn't be able to kill him, so the stroke of unluck ended up summoning a device to capture him instead. Before that, Fuko's unluck could only cause physical damage. However, this time it transformed into a unique unluck based on a specific target. This means that they will just have to research and figure out God in order to create a stroke of unluck that will be able to reach God. Victor tells her to work on controlling her unluck, and he leaves. Fuko demands to know what happened back in 1865, but Victor just tells her to ask you is. Fuko has no clue how to get out of there, so he reveals that he must give a serious kiss to Andy. She is startled at first, but Andy just kisses her. Fuko begins to fade away, but Andy tells her to stop crying. He explains that he's going to merge with his future self, so she better be ready to fall in love with him. Fuko looks forward to it as they say goodbye, and the book of Andy's memories closes. 
Thanks for watching my recap. Sign up to my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel. Link is in the description.